98 years ago, seven boats lined up here on the Isle of Wight for a race the like of which Britain had never seen before. Now, in its 50th edition, who will find themselves writing the next chapter in the Fastnet story? It's a long way to the finish line Got a hard road ahead Anybody gonna stay What makes the very last fast no race an iconic race? I think history. I won't take cops in the rain And your luck's gonna keep me from this door Class 1 yachts over the starting line of cows on the first leg of their fastnet race. Gonna light like fire, coming down like rain. I'm gonna break down barriers. I'm gonna play through the pain. I'm gonna rise like a phoenix. I'm gonna fight through the flame. The devil won't drag me down, cause I'm done. It really is the one they all want to win. And they have certainly shown up in force to do so. 450 boats are lining up here in Kais, smashing the previous record by well over 150. Well, from here, they'll be making their way down the Solent before exiting into the English Channel and making that long journey up to that icon of racing, the Fastnet Rock. There the boats will round the rock and head to the finish line in Cherbourg on Contentine. A myriad of demanding, unpredictable and sometimes brutal conditions await the fleet over the 695 nautical mile route. It is known as offshore sailing's toughest race for a very good reason. For those in the IRC classes, they are hunting for the Fastnet Challenge Cup on which their name will be engraved alongside some of sailing's legends. For others, there are records to beat, line honours to win, and for many, simply the pride in completing a challenge as tough as this. Eight starts are on the card this afternoon with 15 minute intervals between them. The first, the multi-hulls, gets underway in just under 30 minutes time. Hello and welcome along to the iconic Royal Yacht Squadron here in Cowes. And I can tell you the excitement is building here, isn't it? For the 50th edition of the Rolex Fastnet race. And I am joined in the studio here by a team that any skipper would be proud of. I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Boyd, Pete Cumming and Louis Habib. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. Uh, Michael, look, we have to talk about the fact that this is the 50th edition. Just how iconic is this? And why has this, why has this race stood the test of time? Well, uh, it's a very, very special race, particularly the 50th anniversary. I remember as a kid first hearing about this race and I thought it was so challenging and I would never have a chance to do it. But <laughs> Over the years, I managed to uh, complete seven races, get a good result in a couple of those, uh, including a recent one. Um, it's known all over the world as one of the greatest contests in sport of any kind. It's hugely uh, physical, it's hugely psychological, and it's hugely tactical. And uh, it takes a lot uh, to take part in the race. The very fact of entering and completing is a major achievement for any sailor. It is one that is so physically demanding. The word Everest has been used so many times in the context of this. And Pete, you have raced it multiple times, what, seven times now. I mean, what, what would it mean to win the 50th edition of this? Well, it's the, the 50th edition of the, uh, the Rolex Fastnet race. It's the biggest offshore race in the world, 450 boats. And if, you, if that doesn't inspire you to want to get a great result, then what will? I mean, it's, it's an iconic race and it's on a bucket list of every offshore sailor. And Louis, you have been talking, I've been chatting to some of the sailors here. People are excited and there's a lot of them, about 3,000 sailors will be out in that water. What's, what's the general, general atmosphere? What's the feeling been like? Well, first and foremost, um, a lot of these sailors have been waiting two years for this. Some of them a lot more. Um, the weather's turned a little bit rough <laughs> as well. So right now you can feel it's charged up and they just want to get going. And Michael, if I had to ask you to pick out three things, three things that we're going to be looking out for today, what would they be? Well, the first thing is that the fastness consists of many different races. 
and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the different classes, mm. what happens amongst uh, old rivals, uh, what happens in the double-handed fleet, what happens uh, as between the bigger and the smaller boats, how the IRC uh, rating system uh, kicks in. Um, the second thing is that uh, there are many, many prizes uh, for this race, and it'll be interesting to see how some of the uh, people uh, down the course uh, uh, do there's a special prize for the very last boat uh, to finish the so-called galley slave uh, trophy there are team prizes uh, there are three prizes no less for being the uh, best irish boat to finish there are youth prizes and uh, and so on so uh, the main thing though what we'll be watching particularly in light of the weather is how the navigators and the rest of the crew are coping with uh, the challenge it's a very tricky course um, a lot of it's unpredictable we have to go, you have to go around uh, uh, traffic separation schemes. They're a new feature of recent years, and they can often be decisive in the race. So uh, there's a lot, a lot required. Everyone's going to be very busy on board. But these are the three main things that I will certainly be focusing on. Yeah, I on. think I have a feeling the weather is going to feature quite heavily today in what we're talking about. And let me tell you, we have every angle covered for the start of the race just for you, right down to that important landmark of Hurst Castle, about 10 nautical miles or so down the Solent. And co-commentating out on the water for us today, we're delighted to say we have Annie Lush and Mike Golding. Well, hi. From uh, It's now starting to build up out here. Um, the uh, early starts, uh, the early starters have sailed way off down towards Portsmouth because they're going to come in real fast. But the weather's definitely uh, feeling like it's changing right now. Yeah, it's definitely picking up at here at the moment. Um, with the tide state we've got now, we've still got a flat water, but we're looking for that to change when the tide turns later. And um, yeah, the sea state's going to kick up. So I hope that everyone's getting ready on board the boat, not just for the start, but what we're expecting going into tonight. That's going to be the key as this wind builds and the sea state picks up. Thanks very much. Over to you, Holly. Thanks, Annie. Thanks to Mike. Yes, stay safe out there today. And wherever you're watching from at home, we are right across social media today. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok. Uh, just find at Rock Racing. Don't forget to give us a hashtag as well. We'd love to see your photos. And particularly maybe if this is your first time with us here in our little crew. And if you're not familiar with the Fastnet story, well, here's a little look back at what is just an incredible 98 years of sailing. 1924, the Roaring Twenties. Offshore racing is a virtual unknown in the UK, but in the northeastern corner of the United States, enthusiastic yachters had been racing to Bermuda since the early 1900s. It was an act of rebellion, amateur sailors, including women, proving that small boats could safely race offshore. They were proved right. British adventurer Weston Martyr was one of those to make the sprint to Bermuda. He was inspired and wrote to magazines, describing his feeling of utter ecstasy at the sport. Offshore sailing is without question the very finest sport a man can possibly engage in. For to play this game, it is necessary to possess in the very highest degree those hallmarks of a true sportsman, skill, courage, and endurance. Martyr proposed a race of similar length in Britain, one that would test those sporting skills he so eulogized. A course was chosen from the Isle of Wight to Fastnet Rock, a rugged spectre off the southwest tip of Ireland. Boats would round the rock and return to Plymouth, completing what was christened the Ocean Race. Seven yachts heard the starting gun at midday on the 15th of August, 1925, the race was a resounding success, and from it, the Ocean Racing Club was born. The race grew in popularity, and the 30s saw it dominated by entries from across the pond, become biennial, and the Ocean Racing Club obtain royal assent. The Admiral's Cup was founded. It would become the Grand Prix of sailing, with teams competing over a series of races that culminated in the Fastnet. Entry numbers reached 285 by 1977, and the rise of offshore sailing seemed unstoppable. In 1979, a record 303 boats left cows. A brief gale in the Celtic Sea was forecast, but nothing that hadn't been seen in a fastnet race before. Two and a half days in, the forecasted 
brief gale turned into a violent storm. For competitors, there was little warning. Despite the efforts of the largest rescue mission ever seen in peacetime, 19 people lost their lives. It was a stark reminder of the power of nature and the fragility of human endeavor. From the depths of tragedy emerged a renewed commitment to safety and preparedness. Wide-ranging measures were introduced, and the race continued into the 80s and beyond. 99 saw the race separate from the Admiral's Cup, and for the first, and so far only time, a female skipper crowned victor. The turn of the millennia saw new entry classes, a new sponsor in Rolex, new records, and a new finish. Now, 98 years on from that first edition, over 3,000 sailors of different pedigree will take to the water. For some, it's the lure of the win. For others, the chance at an adventure of a lifetime and their love for the open water. The Fastnet Rock, with its mighty lighthouse, still stands sentinel, waiting to greet them. So much history in this race and a new chapter is about to be written. You can see the boats there that have won already on IRC corrected time. And Michael, look, the UK dominant there in the early years, USA in the 30s. But France, look at that, taking many of the titles recently. Where, where did that, where did that tricolour takeover come from? Well, there are many interlocking factors. Uh, France has a fantastic reputation for offshore sailing. It has magnificent competitions, transatlantic around the world. It has some great sailors, great schooling, uh, and great designers and manufacturers, and great joie de vivre. Um, interestingly enough, though, in the last race, uh, in, amongst the top 10 were seven British boats, and that reversed the trend of the previous years. So one of the things to uh, see uh, this time around is uh, how that rivalry will, will play out. And it is a rivalry, isn't it? Is it something you've experienced? Well. Uh, Yes, we have. <laughs> uh, I'm Irish, which is great. I'll, I often find myself being the Kofi Annan between the French and <laughs> yeah. the English, uh, sometimes in, our, uh, in managing the rating system. So I'm chairman of the board of IRC, and uh, that uh, tries to make the race as uh, fair as possible and as even as possible for bo boats of different sizes. We think it does a very good job. That's, that's another factor, is to see how close the boats are on corrected time at the finish. And corrected time determines the overall winner of the race. Very diplomatic too. I was chatting to somebody the other day just about the timings of the race and they questioned whether it was in British time or French time <laughs> and they were almost deeply offended at the fact that it would be French time. Of course it's British time, they say. Look, we've discussed the weather very briefly there. The conditions are looking bleak, it's fair to say. Uh, so let's dive into those conditions and talk about a little bit more with Christian Dumar, our meteorologist. Christian, th these weather conditions are going to play a huge role, particularly in the first 12 hours of this race. Yeah, the wind is blowing about uh, 15 to 20 knots right now on the starting line. The wind is going to increase in the coming hours. And by the time the last boats get out uh, through the needles, uh, it should be blowing probably around 35 knots. And the current is going to be pushing the boat out, so it's going to be against the wind. And the waves will be very, very steep. And then the, the boats will cross the front probably around midnight tonight. Then they'll tack in the right shift behind the front probably in Line Bay. So here you have the animation of a very fast boat, an Imoca boat, and a uh, smaller boat, an IRC boat on the right-hand side. And then the next uh, key point in the race will be the blue zone you see in the north of the screen. So this is a trough, and this zone is going to come to move south, and there is a big wind shift on the northern part of this uh, trough. So the boats will have to go through this light wind zone in westerly winds, and then they get the wind shift on the northern part of this zone, and they will tack and go all the way to the fast net. For the smaller boats, it will be a little more difficult because they will get the wind shift uh, further south, and so it will be a longer time to the fast net. And then on the way back from the fast net, it will be downwind, downwind conditions for all the fleet, so that will be much more comfortable. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, they don't collide, they just the animation. Which, uh, and so the IMOCA boats are expected probably uh, on uh, Monday, Monday evening maybe for the first ones in uh, Cherbourg. And the last RC boats are expected uh, more on the 26th, 27th maybe for the last uh, one. So next uh, Thursday for the last uh, boats probably. So now we see that the 
RNC boats are going to run the fastnet in very light conditions. It's what we call a ridge. And then there is another low pressure coming in behind. But it should be okay for them. The wind will not be too strong and it will be downwind also. Maybe a little upwind conditions just when they round the, the fastnet, but then downwind again as they move uh, towards uh, Cherbourg. And, you know, Louis, you'll know about this too, that just what impact this has on the sailors and what they're thinking right now. I mean, taking a look at that forecast and what this will mean for them, there'll be some nerves there. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, talking to the sailors, uh, the first 12 hours of this race, you aren't going to win it but you could easily lose it. You could break something and, and be out of the race. So I think a lot of them are going to be protecting their boats, protecting their, their crew for the first 12 hours of the race. And as Christian has alluded, it gets really complicated after that. It's, it's not a straightforward, heavy weather race. We're going to see a lot of different wind directions and wind speeds. Louis and to Christian too, thank you so much. Uh, let's go back to Annie and Mike who are on the water of course and listening to that I'm sure it is complicated when we take the weather into account. So what do you think the fleet will be thinking about right now in terms of tactics? I think right now they'll be they'll be thinking about their initial sail plan to go off the line and uh, just thinking, looking at other competitors that Boats tend to look at each other and to see what other sails are, are being run by their own fleets. And they'll be making those choices, but they'll also be thinking about what happens when they get to Hurst. There'll definitely be a 10, maybe more, not increase of wind at Hurst. Plus the weight sea state's going to be very bad. And I mean, it isn't only the boat you've got to think about, is it, Mike? We were just talking to Dee Kafari. She's on board the Volvo 65 Jayo and she's just been advising her crew to get their dinner in now, you know, to eat early. And you've got to think about those practical things because we know by midnight tonight, it'll be very tough on board. You know, if you have any hint of seasickness, those tablets need to have been taken. It's all about preparation in these kind of conditions. I think it's not about being afraid of it, but it's about being ready for it. And that's yourselves and the boat. And it's paramount because we will start to see who's going to come out of this well in the early hours of tomorrow morning. That's when it's going to count. It's not who's first off the start line now. Absolutely. And actually, just as we stand here now, <laughs> we're just getting blasted by that 20, 25 knot uh, wind. It's been relatively quiet here since we came out, but we're right on the island end of the start line and we're feeling those gusts literally now as we talk it's it's getting much wilder yeah so back over to you holly in your nice warm studio <laughs> up there <laughs> and thanks Addy. thanks mike yeah for the first time since i got here i'm very glad we are in the studio right now oh look it's going to be tough out there we know that this is where the experience is going to shine through and when that fleet have rounded the fast net rock and they're going to be making their way to the finish line in cherbourg on contentin and let me tell you it'll all be worth it a party will be waiting for them uh, jean-louis valentin has been in touch he gave us this update from the race village in Cherbourg a little bit earlier. Bonjour Oli, we are here in the Cherbourg en Contentin race village where everybody's come in. The race village opened at 10 a.m. this morning. Everybody's really excited for the race start later on. Everybody's really excited for the arrivals. I'm here with François, the uh, head of the whole race village, and he's going to say a few words. Hi, Holly. Hi, everybody in Cows. Yes, I hope you, you will have a good start. We are really excited to welcome everybody here in Cherbourg. Uh, the first one should arrive uh, very early Monday morning, and we have two prize giving. Uh, spectacular drone uh, show, uh, multiple concerts. We're really excited here. There are more and more people here in the village. So welcome in Cherbourg very soon. We want to see you very soon here in Cherbourg. Invitation. Hey, thanks so much, Jean-Louis. Uh, I'm sure they are getting very excited over there. So we are just approaching 10 minutes to the first start. That will be the multi-hulls. Uh, you can see them getting ready as we approach that one o'clock BST start time. Uh, Pete, some standout boats in this class, let's be honest. All eyes, though, will be on the two Altums. It's the first big race for both of them. What are your thoughts on the design? They're absolute monsters. Yeah. Um, they're just... There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. They, ten um, minutes. Ten, ten minutes, minutes to go. That's the warning. That. Um, yeah, they're absolute monsters. They're just built to break records. They're hugely powerful. They're the fastest yachts ever built, and they are currently the fastest boats in the world. 
Um, they're totally designed for the guys driving them, for Armel, and they've come from the same design house, VPLP, but Francois and Armel are very much, they drive how the internals operate. And, you know, most sailors can get on any yacht and take it off the dock, pull the sails up and go sailing. Those things are like spaceships. You know, you get on and you wouldn't even know how to pull a main up on them. Um, so they have massive hydraulic functions. The guys, it's just so physical for them. Um, and we're wishing the best of luck in through the needles today. I mean, they, there's a reason they draw such a, a crowd. They are the fastest boats in the world. Um, do we expect the multi hull line honours records to be broken today? Is that likely? Absolutely. We yeah. heard in the press conference Andrew Cape saying, lucky, the monohull record um, is in danger, which means the multi hull is equally as in danger. I think uh, those guys are going to be out there pushing. Gitana are the current holders. These guys are the direct competitors, so they're going to want to take the title and break the record in the biggest offshore race in the world. Now, we've uh, been discussing a lot of the action here. We've been discussing uh, Louis lifting the Fastnet Challenge Cup, you know, taking line honours. But for some of the fleet, I mean, just being here, competing in this, this is an accomplishment in itself. We can't stress that enough. Yeah, you, you know, the, the, the Rolex Fastnet race... 98 years on, but the, the, the Rourke, the Royal Ocean Race Club, was built on this race, and generation after generation of sailors have taken it on. Mm. And to finish the fast set race, it's the kind of thing you'd put on your CV. Forget about the fact that it's sailing. It's, it's such a tough accomplishment to do this. It says something about the people that do. I think all the noise and commotion tells us we are getting close, aren't we? <laughs> Michael, look, you are the chairman of the IRC board. Uh, it is something that we've referred to. We've talked an awful lot about it today. Can you just explain uh, what IRC is and, and why it makes it fair for the pros and the Corinthians? Right. Well, first of all, uh, the thing to say is that it's a rating system. It's not a handicap system, i.e. it's not the same as a horse race or a golf handicap. It's not based on prior performance. Uh, the rating is based on the design of the yacht, uh, the, uh, the boat's equipment, its sails, and so on. It's a secret rule, so the formula is not disclosed, and it is, uh, it is applied at the moment all over the world, particularly to these uh, classic uh, uh, long-distance races. Um, it's constantly being refined to take into account uh, new uh, design features. Uh, there are many criticisms of it, uh, but uh, we believe uh, it's very hard to design a successful one for that wide range of boats, yeah. and this is fit for purpose, in our opinion. Thank you, Michael. Look, we are very close to the start now. Uh, just before I hand over to our commentary team, uh, in between all the parties and the training and all the rest, we have managed to catch up with some of those who are about to take on this challenge, and they've told us what the Rolex Fastnet race means to them. It's an experience like no other experience around here. It, it's something that sailors from all around the world come together and they... Uh, I can't put it into words. For me, it's an um, honor to try to do the race with this old boat. It will be not easy. The beginning of the start will be very rough. But uh, after the rough, you have the sun, and after the sun, you can go again. The first aim is, is to finish, score as best as we can, and um, let's say when looking back, not, not having the feeling that we could have done better. Our, our words for our rivals are, um, we hope everyone comes back safely, um, but again, we're going to be fiercely competitive to make sure that we win those service, service awards. So going around that rock, I think, is... It's going to be a pretty magical moment for everyone, and we're kind of really looking forward to it. And I think that's kind of what makes this so iconic. It's such a challenge, and it is, you know, the one for offshore sailing in the world. Imagine manoeuvring 131 feet of trimaran. You'd have your heart in your mouth all the time. You want to Okay, 
on to the action then, and we start big, the multi-holes. Uh, they will be the first to start and finish the race with just five minutes until the sound of the first gun. Let's get the 50th Rolex Fastnet race started. Over to your commentary team, Mike Golding, Annie Lush, Louis Habib and Pete Cumming. Thanks, Holly. Well, we've watched uh, a few of the multi-holes having a few test runs um, from the east up to the western silent, and they are absolutely ripping. SVR, Francois Gabar has done an early run. I would estimate he's been at speeds of 20 to 25 knots already. We've seen the Amokas doing a few runs. They've been up on the foils. Uh, it's, it's looking full on out there. Uh, I mean, I can't stress how nervous these guys must be because it's like downhill skiing you can be the fastest skier on the slope and have all the skills but you've got another 439 boats there we go four and minutes to go. the start now we're going to see these guys lining up uh well to the east all they want to do is get a timed run with the wind so left and when i mean left it's coming off more of the Isle of Wight shore, we're looking at like it's going to be a very port hand favoured start. So the guys are going to be wanting to start on port and doing the longest run. What you don't want to be doing in a multi hole is any manoeuvres early on. You want to just get the boat up and ripping. And we're looking at the start here, and I can see Bank Populaire and SVR looming over the fleet. Now, these guys are just trying to find some space. You don't want to get locked out with the small Ocean 50s or the, uh, the gunboats of Tosca and Alex Thompson. I can see on the island shore here, we've got Zulu. Basically, the, the rule is the bigger the multi-hull, the harder it is to move. And to give you a bit of context, if you're in your old team or your Mod 70 on the start line here and you have to bear away, you'll send your boat from five knots suddenly jumping up to 30 knots as you go into the power zone. So these guys are going to be really, it's a game of chess here, position yourself into the start. Looking at SVR there, you can see no head sails out. Basically, these guys are down below, so they have such limited visibility. All the head sails, the furled sails you can see on the front of the boat, they're away. They're trying to have a look in front of them. Where are the boats? Do we need to avoid anything? What you don't want to do is have a collision or any snarl ups with any boys. We've got the current here that is just pushing them back from the line as well. So it's a very hard time and distance. I would estimate we're 2.30 now. You can see a few head sails starting to come out. The slower, heavier boats, they need a bit more horsepower. We can see on our screen Tosca, Alex Thompson. They've got a head sail out. Alex, obviously, very, very experienced in the offshore sailor. Here we've got Bank Populaire again. They're the same as SVR. Armel's just leaving his head sails. You can see through the gap in front of the mast. He's keeping maximum visibility as he's, believe it or not, on the bow. An Ocean 50, that's a 50-foot trimaran. It looks absolutely tiny. So they're going to be looking over their shoulder, seeing these things, monsters looming over their shoulder. And they're not going to want to be in the way. And it, they'll just run them over. So they've got to now position themselves. You can see them. Yes, um, just, to, just to say, Pete, I don't want to cut you. you you're doing a, a fantastic... I mean, what a sight looking at the... There were 23 boats in this start. And uh, as you say, the two old teams are by far and away the quickest boats, well, in the world, let alone this race. But we've also got uh, nine uh, Ocean 50s. We can just see Saviol there coming through the screen. And um, it's the course record that the old teams are going to go after. And we'll just remind everybody at home what that is. So the course record for the multi-hulls is one day, nine hours, 14 minutes, 54 seconds. And Pete, we reckon it's on. What do you reckon? Are we, are we taking, taking liberties to say 24 hours? I, I would say you're only going to be shaving a couple of hours off that. But when you, you, know, when you think of that, they're going to be covering 685 miles in you know, just over 24 hours. So we're going to see now 50 seconds to go. We're going to see SVR. They're going to start putting their bows down. And uh, yeah, this is it. We're going to go to Steve Cole, principal race officer. 88. 88 coming down the line on starboard. The rest of the boats are on port squadron end. FRA 82, the group closest boat to the line. 88 be the closest boat to the line 20. 20 seconds line is clear Lodi group is now bearing away bearing away towards 88 coming back up now 88 fleet starting to accelerate towards the line now Lodi group still the furthest forward all clear line clear Allegra Allegra 
The excitement is definitely leveling. Looking at the crowds here, the hoods are up, the phones are out. What is going to be going through their minds right now? Well, it's as we thought, everyone really trying to get away on port. We had one guy coming down the line. That was Allegra coming down on Starboard, but they've bailed out. They've tacked onto port. You want to get yourself up the Solent and clear of the traffic. Zulu had a lovely start on the island shore. You can see them sheeting on their heavily reef. They're two reefs and looks like a J2, but they're preparing for the bigger breeze they're going to see. We've got 20 knots just off the squadron here, but they know that within uh, a few minutes, they're going to be getting up to 20 to 25 possibly 30 knots as they head up the Western Silent. What a start. I mean, this is incredible to see it in action there. Some people getting a really good start underway. Uh, Mike and Annie, you're out there with arguably the best view. What's been happening? Well, it's amazing. Really good start by Zulu. Um, probably got a nose in front, maybe beaten by one of the smaller uh, ORC-50 multi-holds. Uh, but... Uh, no, now we're starting to see the old teams actually winding up to speed. It takes them quite a while to get the boat up to full speed, but the priority for them is have a safe start and try and avoid all the other boats around them. They won't be necessarily looking for maximum speed at the moment. I've got to say, Holly, actually, I was feeling very nervous for them myself, thinking I don't want to be on SBR or Bank Pop right now. It looked very tricky. The, yeah, for sure, the smaller boats were much more manoeuvrable than them. And um, right now we can see them, you know, just trying to find a way through so they can get to their speed, aren't yeah. we? But, um, yeah, I was feeling nervous for them. As Pete was saying, very hard to manoeuvre, and we could see that. What's, uh, what's interesting is over here on the island shore, as we sit here, we're actually seeing quite a lot of current under us. Just offshore where they are, the current's against them. So there's a, a definite swirl here that's going to be a factor in the next start in, in eight minutes time. Or and whatever. gives a big advantage to the smaller boats actually at the moment. So while those big boats look impressive, big sails, they're very limited by the depth. And with the smaller boats get the opportunity to come in here into the better current and also and actually, the shift if you, off the island if you look shore. out there now you'll just be able to see that the the big multis are just starting to wind up and maybe even getting up on their foils a little bit because they've suddenly extended away and uh, they'll be they'll be able to carry on on that board for another maybe another mile and then they will have to tack because there's shallow water in there and they won't be wanting to do any damage. So the tack onto starboard will see themselves directly across the Solent and they'll have to do another long port tack. Yeah, we, can, we saw uh, quite a few different sail setups out here looking into what's going to happen going forward. So uh, back over to you there, Holly, in the, in the studio. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Mike. I mean, this was always going to be a tricky start given these conditions, but who is standing out there for you? I mean, we focused a lot on the old teams, but looking at Zulu there, uh, we've really Lloyd Perron and the team, Eric Maras, the skipper and owner of that boat, they absolutely nailed it. They're much more manoeuvrable than the old teams, had a very clean start, and they're actually leading the fleet. The two old teams now, like Mike said, they're stretching their legs. They're trying to get those foils you can see hanging under the boat, elevators on the rudders and big J foils on the front. It, hull speed is critical for the foils to work. It's not about wind speed. It's about can you get your boat up to foiling speed. We're looking at around 20 knots for these boats. And as we saw there briefly, both boats having their time to shine. They got the hull speed, put the bow down, the foils generate the lift. As soon as you can reduce that wetted surface area, you're at double speed. So these boys really pushing and we can see between between the old teams, SVR and Bank Populaire, how competitive these will be. They're going to be very, very evenly paced throughout this race. Yeah, and Pete, tell us about Bank Populaire's position in relation to, uh, to uh, SVR. Well, they did a really nice job. They had a run at the line. They had much more. They got up to pace a lot quicker. Francois and SVR, they got a little bit locked in with the smaller boats, but now we can see... Bank Populaire has got the ability to put the bow down, which means just turn the bow away from the breeze and just get the hull speed generated. And that's as you put your bow away from the breeze, you generate more, more power, more apparent wind speed. That creates more energy, more boat speed, and they get those massive falls that we can see at the front of the boat dragging through the water. They generate lift and will lift the whole platform clear of the water. I think something we see as well with the big boats, you know, in conditions like this, this is where they thrive. This is where they can build up some real speed here in these conditions. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I experienced this last year on the uh, on the Argo Mod 70. As soon as these 100 footers cleared Hearst Castle, they had another level of gear change and they were off. Just to say that noise you heard there means it is 10 minutes to the Amokers, the next start. Um, but yes, the multi hull still underway. The first, the first of this edition of the Fastnet race well underway now. Yeah, and it's lovely to see the fleet get away cleanly. That would really help the uh, help the nerves settle and these guys will start getting set up for the race now. Yes, what an incredible start then, looking at the multi-hulls here. Given, this, give, given the start, I mean, who is looking the most promising then? Well, I think, you know, you, you've got to look down the fleets. We can see the smaller boats are obviously pushing a lot closer to the line because they can really slow the boats. The big old teams hanging back. You can see the grey hulls of Zulu, the dark black sails, the grey hulls. They definitely won the start. They were up at pace, crossed the line. A very, very close start there from uh, from Zulu and... One of the uh, Ocean 50s, I think. And there. Lodi Group there. Yeah. Very nice start there, bang on the line. But look at that, such a diverse, all shapes and sizes of the multi-hulls. That's a great thing about the multi-class. They come in such different shapes and sizes. But then look at this. As soon as these 100 footers get a little bit of space, they're off. The I've got to say, I've got to get in it. That's black cap, the little yellow uh, try around there. That's pretty impressive to be up there with those <laughs> boys, isn't it? And the scary thing is, Louis, these guys are doing 15 knots plus <laughs> and they're going past like they're standing still, which I mean, is a bit soul destroying for the little boats, but they're still to have, they're going to have a very tight race, the Ocean 50s as well. Right. But I'm these... giving a shout out Thierry Roger on the uh, on the little yellow black, it's... black cat. Woohoo! <laughs> It is the one thing that we do love about this category it is the range. So one start down. We've got seven more to go. And next, it's the turn of the Amokas. Uh, let's go back to Annie. Look, an impressive collection of these 60-foot flying machines. Uh, what are you looking out for at this start? Yeah, Holly, I've got to confess, this is the start I'm very excited about. Um, we've got a great Amoka fleet here today. And um, personally, I'm watching the new boats. So... We've got Massif um, with Charlie Dallin, um, only launched in June, um, and Choral, and also Thomas Royon's new boat. And Mike and I are quite excited to sort of speed, to, you know, to see the speeds that they can do. These are the new generation of mockers. The boats are just getting faster and faster. And we've got a couple of British competitors in here as, uh, too. Uh, we've got Sam Sam Davies with uh, new foils and uh, Sam Goodchild sa sailing for the first time on his his new boat that he plans to do the Vendée Globe with. So, yeah, um, and we also have Pip Hare. So we've got on Medallia. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Pip's. Also, uh, she's been training in Paul, which is my which yeah. is my home ground. She's just had a huge rebuild on her boat by Joff Brown um, and uh, the boat's looking fantastic. This is the first real test for her. So a really exciting moment for Pip in this race. Absolutely. Um, Joff, Joff uh, w once worked for us, so he was a, a very talented guy and <clears throat> he's done a great job turning that boat around. And now with the new foils, you know, Pip's got loads of potential there to do much better than she's done historically with the boat. So I, I think she should be pretty good. Yeah, so actually Pip's racing the, the same generation of boat that I just raced in the ocean race and, and you know, with new foils. Uh, the biggest thing we saw in the ocean race with the Amokas is not only their top speed, but also reliability. Yeah. I think she, you know, she's put a lot of work into that with Joff. Um, so I think she can feel very confident going into tonight. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's all well and good having a brand new boat, but it's, are you going to get through tonight? Is it going to be reliable? And, uh, you know, I would be slightly nervous being on one of those newer boats if your boat was only launched in June. That's absolutely right. Yeah. You've got, you've and, got a bit on. No question. To, you know, the fronts that are coming through tonight as they exit the Solon, it, well, earlier than that, as they, but tonight, the fronts are really going to test these boats. If there's any weakness, the boat, the boat will uh, quickly break down. So, and and any failure on an Amoka, we were talking about it earlier. Any small failure of equipment can mean uh, completely slowing down and losing loads of time. So, the reliability is the key, and the fastness a great test because you're pretty much doing a, a little bit of everything. Yeah. So the big difference on a boat like the Amoka is that. Um, 
we're not driving the boats, it's on an autopilot, which sounds easy, but actually you've got to control the autopilot. And that means if any of your sensors go wrong, suddenly it starts driving like a very, very bad driver and you're, you know, you're 30% slower. So um, making sure that the boat's reliable is, is absolutely key. And someone else, another another girl we've got out here racing, Clarice Clermer. This is her first week in her new boat. Yeah. We know the boat's very good. Came second in the last one day. Yeah. But, you know, this is a you know, big test for her. First time back in a while and really excited to see what she can do in, in Loctane. Her yeah, new boat. She's, she's just had a baby, so she's recovering from that as well. So she's got lots on. And all that these means boats she's very good at not sleeping, Mike, though. She's 100% <laughs> prepared for this fast net. But, uh, of course, all these boats ultimately are preparing now for the Vendée Globe. And the, the, fast net, the, the Rolex Fastnet race is really one of the key events to help you to prepare for a, an event like that. And, uh, but right now, I think we should probably go back to the studio, back to Holly. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Annie. I mean, love hearing these stories about who is on board the experience. And I can just say that absolutely not sleeping will definitely help them out. <laughs> not being able to sleep will definitely help them out on this race. Four minute signal there again, you were hearing. I can get some live pics of the Canada Ocean and L'Occitane in the black and yellow, that French boat. What do you make of this? Yeah, L'Occitane is very interesting. This boat's been in the shed in Gosport for the last uh, last few months, being handed over to Clarice Kramer with her new sponsor, L'Occitane. Uh, Co-skip Alan Roberts, a very experienced Figaro racer. Um, it's lovely to see him getting a, a break into the Amoka Sixes as well. But they're going to be pensive. It's going to be nervous. It's being handed a very, very new toy, and it's going to be a little bit alien to them. They're going to be looking at everything, and you know they've just got to build up the hours to get the confidence and experience with this new Amoka 60. They're so technical. Everyone is very, very different. You won't jump on two Amokas the same now. The designs are so radically different. The systems are so different. So there'll be some nerves on there, but they just get it. Need to get a few hours and a few miles under their belt and get out the Solent cleanly. Once you've done that, just prepare yourself for what's going to be a bumpy night and uh, and move on from there. Yeah, and, and Pete, I think right on screen right now, we've got the massive difference. and We've got a lot of foiling new Imokas in this race. But on the left of picture, that is Canada Ocean Racing, Scott Scheuer and Martin Stromberg, uh, which is a non-foiling boat, Pete. It's a non-foiling boat, but actually, you know, every every boat has their day. And speaking to Annie earlier, this was actually the uh, the same boat that Annie did the uh, ocean, uh, the Mediterranean Ocean race, um, and they actually won. They beat all the foiling Imokas. So when it's when that boat's in its sweet spot, and these guys are going to be going up wind today, they've got the straight dagger board, so they're non-foiling. But those dagger boards are much more efficient for going up wind, helping the boat reduce the leeway. As soon as the foiling boats can get on the foil, that's when they come into their zone. Wicked. Well, we're, we're getting close to the uh, start for the Amokas. Uh, Matricock on screen right now. That was the winner of the last Ooh. Vendée Globe. You can't get more impressive than that. And uh, it's, it's quite a sight. I, 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 all of these uh, sailors are used to these sort of conditions. But what do you think is going through their minds, Pete? Probably, wow, what a lot of boats around me. <laughs> I mean, like we say, you can be confident and in control of your boat, but when you've got so much traffic and so, so much expensive hardware around you, you know, you've just got to preserve it. You don't want to have a clangor on the start line. You don't want to be making any headlines for the wrong reasons. You want to get yourself off the start line, get some space, and get into some open ocean. But um, what a sight to see so many of these boats in such a strong class. Yeah, and we're just over a minute to the start for the Imoka in the Rolex Fastnet race. And we will be going back to Steve Cole at 45 seconds to go. Be very interesting to see what he's got to say. Um, Pete, you spotted something? Tell us about it. Yeah. Well, pretty much 99% of the fleet on port. One minute, and with one, one boat go. coming across on starboard, looks like oh, yeah. Paprec, who are coming in on starboard, yeah, which is a real cat it. amongst the pigeons here. Yeah. So, so just to, just for uh, viewers that don't understand port and starboard, there will be some. Pete, just explain what uh, what that reference is. Most basic rule in sailing: starboard is right away boat, port is give way boat. Okay, so basically what you're saying is that Paprec actually has rights coming in here. Well, they've just tacked under the fleet now, and they're looking to line up and get a space on the line. All right, over 30 to seconds Steve. to go. Let's get over to Steve then. It's to the line. Medallia still closest to the line, but not over. Medallia still closest. Medallia speeding up now. Medallia is just about to be OCS. Medallia OCS. Chorale is the next boat. 
Chiral will be the next boat. Ten seconds to go. Chiral, OCS. Two, one. OK, well, um, we could hear clearly the principal race officer there, Steve Cole, saying that he thought that Medallia and Chiral are over. And the rules have actually changed for this race for safety, and they will not be recalled. There is no individual recall in the Rolex Fasting race this year. What happens is that if they are deemed to have been over the line, they get a two-hour penalty. How big a penalty is two hours in a race this long, Pete? About two hours, <laughs> which is which is a lifetime. What what it's, impact does that have then? What impact? If you, with mentally, right now, that's happened. What are you thinking? Shouldn't have been over. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a real Nothing kick in the guts. Now. These guys are prepared so hard, and w the one thing you say to your crew is, "This race will not be won and lost on the start line, but we just don't want to be over the line or have a crash." And if you can tick those boxes, you've had a good start. But, you know, it's a real shame for Pip. That's just, uh, they've got a little bit of current taking them over as well, and they just mm. got to the line a bit too keen. At, at this stage, will they know? Will they be aware that they've been over the line? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure whether they're being contacted by the race committee. But, uh, yeah, Medallia and Chiral over the line, they'll know they're close for sure. They'll have it all on, their, uh, on the technology on board, on their B&G displays or whatever they're using. So they'll have it in their gut that they were pretty close or, if not, over the line. So there'll be a little bit of disappointment. But like in racing, these things happen. Shake it off and get on with the next 694 miles. OK, who else has stood out for you there? Who's had a good start? Well, the fleet were very, very congested on the line. Initially, Sam Goodchild had a very nice start um, on uh, My Planet. I think uh, you can't get away from the bright yellow boat uh, on the shore there, Louie. You can probably confirm who that is for me. I can't see from my position. Oh, there we go. Well, it, it's, uh, it's obviously a Lamy Caline, but that is not how it's entered in the... Uh, race. So okay. uh, we'll just call it La Michele. Well okay. done. Hence well my done. confusion. But look <laughs> at those foils. You can see they've got little uh, little gates on the foil to stop the air running down them. So lots of different ideas on these boats, but a very nice start on the uh, on the island shore. And they'll be just uh, trying to stay as high as possible so they can make this port tack last as long as possible before they have to do a little tack over as soon as they hit the mainland and get back onto the Isle of Wight shore. OK, let's get over to Annie and Mike. Annie, Mike, I mean, two boats over the line there. Chiral Medallia, British Hope. What, what do you make of it? Yeah, Phil for Pip there, watching her. She looked like she was setting up in a good spot, but just a bit early. Um, probably for the spectators, you think, you know, isn't it, isn't it simpler to start than that? But like the old teams, actually on the Amoka, visibility is very hard. And um, certainly now we've got some tide starting to run with us here. So the closer you are towards where we are here, which is on the land side of the line, actually, the more you're going to start to get pushed over. And uh, that might be a bit of a surprise for some of the boats. I think maybe that's what caught them out there because uh, we have got quite a bit of tide running here. And to my eye, either they got the best start, but or they were also over, and that's Paprik. Yeah. You know, in, in which either way, it's uh, a difficult situation to know to start the race knowing you're going to lose two hours. But on the other hand, there's nothing you can do. It there's no room to turn round. It wouldn't be safe to try and turn your boat round and come back in these conditions. But they had a lovely clear start. What's noticeable is that all the other boats, the other fleets, have kept well clear and they had a pretty good clean start. Yeah, I mean, um, it's actually very unusual to start a race on port. As we heard about earlier, starboard has the right of way. And we did have one boat on starboard. And I think actually, probably, probably me on just thought, it's not worth even trying to do this. This is no, too dangerous. I'm yeah. just going to get onto port. And he made a great start. Also, we saw Thomas Royon for the people. In for the people, I think he made a fantastic yeah. start. Managed to get nice and clean. And you could see the boat suddenly accelerate away. But that's meant that he's had to sail further down the line, which is not the advantageous side. Probably a bit more adverse current out there, and he's not going to get the wind shift. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens now further up the track. Was it worth, like Sam Davies on Initiative Curve and some of the other boats, just waiting, not having the best start, but being further upwind up here on the land side? Or is it better just to get clean our air and be you know, further offshore, but just nice and clean and able to go fast? We'll see what happens. I think either way, uh, you're best not to start by losing two hours. <laughs> but that's easy to say from, from our viewpoint. But uh, anyway, back to Holly.
Thanks, Mike. You know, these are experienced teams. We know that these things happen, but just how important will that be as this, as this race progresses? Yeah, experience is key, but also, you know, technology is key. And I think we've got to look at these images that we're seeing. You've got uh, these boats, just, and speaking to Annie earlier, who's just finished the, uh, the ocean Ten race. Minutes to class the, the new foils, which are five and a half meters long for the 2024 generation Vendee boats, they just need 14 knots of boat speed to get up on the foil. It's unbelievable. And we're seeing such amazing images. You just see that all the different designs, the design houses coming up with these different foils, some fat, some thin, some long, some short. But, you know, these boats are like skimming stones. When you walk down the beach and you find that perfect stone to throw and make it just bounce over the water, you look at the hull shapes now and they're just skimming, skimming stones with wings. Uh, and this is an almost unique sight in the solar, isn't it, to have 20, 29 Imokas going for it you know we're not going to see this again for at least two years are we no and it's a it's a pretty special sight and it's something to be you know that's why the crowds come out and you know as we stand here at the royal yacht squadron we can see that the the crowds who have come out they're such amazing boats and this it's just sailing has changed it's it's in my lifetime it used to be you know i, I used to work for mike golding and we had a, a fino design then a mervone design and at that point we thought God, the boats can't get any better than this. This is it. We found <laughs> the best boat design in the world. And then you look at it now and think, oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> well, let's see it again. Let's see that run to the line and yeah. uh, talk us through this here and who you think has stood out. Look at this. And there's Medallia, so you can see across the line first. Yeah, you can see Medallia. Pip yeah. just realising she's put the boat, trying to get the nose up into the breeze and slow down. But unfortunately, with this amount of current, even if you turn the boat sideways to try and get away from the line, you're just being, you're on a conveyor belt. You're standing. She could be gutted, would not she? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, these things happen, Louie, and you've just got to shake it off. Clear your head now. Think about the big picture. You're in an offshore race. Get your head down and work hard and try and make up those two hours. Yeah, look, we are just a matter of seconds away from that crucial four-minute signal. So uh, let's get in to the Class 40s. Yeah, so I believe we've got 24 starters uh, on this one, Holly, or about 24 starters anyway. And wow, what a collection of scow bows, manoir designs. We've got some, we've got some proper warriors from days gone by as well. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, if you take the Amoka 60s and you just click down on scale down, scale down, scale down, about three or four clicks, then you've got a class 40. And, and if you talk skimming stone, these things are absolute skimming stones. Uh, yeah, and a la uh, Gran Pirelli in Broglio Beccaria. Uh, and Italian as well, and one of the favourites. Yeah, one of the favourites. They've had great form in the, some of the, uh, the single-handed and uh, Caribbean 600 first in. So, uh, yeah, very, very good boats. They've got a few miles under their belt now, and, and Pirelli got to be one of the favourites. Yeah, but we know in this category the French have dominated in the past, but it'll be the Italians we're looking out for. I fair to say there's a lot of excitement around the Class 40. Uh, Short-handed, uh, safe to take offshore, and quick, and the competition's really good. So there is a big level of competition between designers, so it's really pushing us towards uh, making better boats. You know, we've just been discussing it here, Louis. We've just been talking about the fact that the crowds were looking beneath us here, and I cannot tell you how wet and miserable it is, and it hasn't put people off, has it? Oh, they're five deep. They're five deep from the parade all the way up, probably to Egypt Point. There might be five <laughs> deep at Gernard, Pete. Well, I mean, it, we, what a show they put on. I mean, they've come out in the driving rain, in the cold, to watch what, what's been two spectacular starts with the multi-hulls, seeing 100-foot-old teams up on foils, the fleet of Imokas up on foils flying past them. I mean, it's, it's definitely a worthwhile day out just to uh, see such a spectacle. And let's talk about the Class 40. I mean, the number of designers still actively involved in this class, I think that's what makes this really exciting. Yeah, I mean, uh, Sam Manoir is, is the golden boy at the moment in the Class 40, but we're getting to start, start to see some other designers come in for the Mini. Is that a fair one, Pete? You know but more about it than I do. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a, it, it's a bit of an open design book, really. People are going wider, they're going more scale bow, um, and people's takes on it. It's an ex exciting class to see develop, again, like the Amokas. Very, it really does promote people coming out with, you know, 
quite wacky designs and we're seeing Ipsa um, in the shot there. They've got like a double um, kind of chine on the side of the boat. It's one of the newest designs. It's got, uh, I was speaking to Brian Thompson because they have the design in tequila, which is a slightly older generation of the same design. They have less rocker in the hull, but you can see on Pirelli, the chain plates, the metal parts on the boat that they actually hold the mast up. Now they create a lot of spray and a lot of drag. So they on uh, Ipsa, they put up this kind of protective board down the top and it creates a bigger chine, a bigger surface area and just makes the boat more powerful and less draggy. So some very interesting designs. And I was down with Brian Thompson and Alistair Richardson on tequila. They're currently fifth in the class 40 standings. And I stood by the mast, looked forward, looked back like, well, which is the front? <laughs> like the both ends are exactly the same size. So yeah, they're wacky designs, that's for sure. But it does mean the technology is so exciting. I think I was reading that the fleet here, more than half are less than three years old, which is remarkable. Yeah, you can tell by the, the actual sail number, which is also on the bow. So that the, the bigger the number, the, the newer the boat. So we've got there at the moment, we've got 184, 168. You can see that generation running through um, 181 there. So you can see these are really late boats. I think at the moment the top one's about 190. So we, we've got a hell of a fleet here, Pete. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's they, they do a good job to keep the cost down in this fleet. So rather than Imokawa, you can have a runaway budget with the class 40s. So they're Kevlar and foam hulls. They're no carbon rigging. It's all rod rigging. A four so minute warning. They do a lot to um, you know stop the budgets running away um, and, and designing infinite amounts of sales and you know all those things where you can really price people out the class it's a very inclusive and it's a great entry into these uh, offshore boats yeah yeah and we've got we've got under four minutes to go just heard the gun go and um well i wouldn't say it's the most aggressive looking start but uh, after the last one with two over how do you see this pete well, again you know you learn you learn your lessons and they've had a you know a great option to sit back and watch two classes go it's always good to learn look at the approaches but they've got on their screens on all the boats, they've got time and distance, so they'll know where they are back from the line yep. in distance and in time. So they'll be talking to each other saying, okay, we are one minute back, we've got 30 seconds to burn or what have you. So yeah, we're just basically yeah, watching I've got them to, get I've got to give a position. shout out here, FRA 115. That's Carlo Vroon, son of the late great Pete Vroon uh, that died just before the fast net. And Carlo keeping the Vroon tradition alive. His father raced 60 years and uh, was a Rort member for many, many years. And we cannot go through the Rolex Fastlet race without mentioning the late, great Pete Vroom. Very well said, Louis. Um, I, I touched on it a little earlier on, just talking about the fa fact that France has dominated in, in this category over the years. But we're watching the Italians very closely today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, you know, Pete's alluded to it. We've got this new designer that's coming through. I think he's both the top Italian boats are from the design board of Gianluca Guelfi. Um, and, and, and Pete knows an awful lot more about the, uh, the design than me. And with two minutes, 15 to go, Pete, I'm looking at the, the racetrack. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, it's one thing about the design, but not to forget that Pirelli was actually a self-build. So oh, the amazing. great thing about these classes is he's gone away, he's taken the design, and it's I mean, obviously there's going to be a professional element to it, but it's you know that's how you keep the budget down, and you absolutely yep. know yep. your craft when you uh, when you build your own boat, you know where everything is and what it can and can't do. And seeing the fleet, they're just again all sitting on port, they're just approaching the line cautiously, some with head sails out, some just keeping them furled up to give themselves maximum visibility. But now there's a, they're lining up, jostling position. What you don't ever want to do, you can see Ipsa there. They've got a boat tight to lured on the right-hand side of them. You want to have a, give yourself a little bit of gap to lured of you so you can put the bow down, put, turn the bow away from the wind, build your boat speed up and get the boat. When the gun goes, your goal is to hit the line at full 100% pace and have the boats on the wind and uh, sailing at 100% of its yeah. polars. I mean, you get some idea of the carnage out there. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> well, you can see these smaller boats, they're so much more manoeuvrable. You know, the old teams, they get in a lane and they start. The Yamokas do a little bit of wiggling and now the class 40s, you know, they can pretty much turn on their keel. So they're just jostling around to find the best position, give themselves some space. One minute to go. It's a remarkable class, this, and you touched on it earlier, the fact that how much it's changed the sport, you know, to make it more accessible, the fact that they tightly restricted the materials to limit costs. How much has that had an impact on the sport? It just makes it accessible. You, yeah. you know, if you're aspiring to be an Imoka sailor with infinite budget, this is your, uh, this is your grassroots entry into, uh, into the big boys league.
Yeah, well, let's uh, let's see them in action then. Over to Steve. All right, one, one, five, all very close. 30. 30 seconds to the start. The boat that was OCS has borne away. There's another one, FRA 115, OCS. 20. Stand by, SUI 186, OCS. ITA 181, OCS. 10. FRA 165, OCS. Five, four, FRA 168, three, FRA 190. Zero. Stand by for numbers. FRA 190, FR 165, 172, OCS. And he's so many over the line there. What can you see? Hi, yeah, we're here on the line. Mike and I are watching. Even at two minutes to go, I think we have boats very near to being over the line. I think they've all been taken by surprise by this tide, the amount of tide we've already got running with them here. Um, we thought Ipsa were going to do really well. They managed to tack out, even though they were only in comeback, but they were, they were still over. We heard Pete saying there, you know, that they've got technology on board telling them where the line is which is all well and good but actually once you've got this current run un running underneath you there's not much you can do well, however maneuverable you your boat is. I, I heard someone say earlier it looked like a much more relaxed start it wasn't in that last minute I mean it was pretty clear that nearly everyone was over but now they're up and running because of the rule that prevents them from coming back they just have to keep going there's no option to return and so they they just keep going yeah that was that was such a difficult start for them everyone got racked up very early and very close to the line and i saw for a lot of the boats i think they realized that they were getting pushed over but there was just no room to actually you know be able to turn around and, and come was, back there was one of the old class 40s just came past us going the other way uh, and actually he might have done quite well he might have had a very good start so um but this is a fantastic fleet of boats. I, I did the race, the last edition of the race, on one of these class 40s. Uh, and this edition, weather-wise, is quite similar to those conditions. So uh, they're extraordinary boats to sail in these conditions. And while they're not maybe as technically advanced as the Amokas, it's a fantastic fleet and the racing is extremely close. It looked like a um, yeah, very fun boat to do the start in. And I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens now as they go up the course, because I think they would have seen the Amokas and they would have seen the gains the Amokas were making on this side, on the land side. So I think we had a couple of boats starting late, but very close to us, didn't yeah. we? And uh, we're already starting to see them, you know, to make gains right now. Yeah, so, I think uh, the boats that are starting very close to us are the boats that are winning in the end you yeah. know when they get a decent start on this end of the line they're getting this sluice of tide that's just advancing them giving them a longer port tack to uh, to a longer port tack to make some gains before they have to hook across onto starboard well, let's um, go back to you in the studio now to hear who managed to make it over the line <laughs> and who was ocs Thanks, Annie. Yes, yeah, so many OCSs there. I mean, this is unheard of. This is a very experienced fleet. And yet here we are, just the numbers taken by surprise by that tide. Welcome to the Salem. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we battle week on, week out. Um, it, you can never underestimate the tide here. It absolutely rips. And I think we saw the, uh, the starts earlier benefiting from a fairly slack tide or a little bit against, but now the tide is kind of flooding out and it's catching uh, catching these guys out for sure. So they were on a conveyor belt that they couldn't get off there. But for us, the, the, the um, Class 40 with a lighthouse on the sail, the three brothers, actually with two generations there, that uh, there's a father and it's son, the son, affair. 12, who's only 14 years old on that boat. They had a great start. We're a little bit still unclear from the committee who was over and who wasn't. So I'm not going to name too many names. But yeah, I think we, we think they're all right. We think they're all right. Yeah, yeah we think they were a yeah. clean starter. And, and left of picture there with that red dot on the sail, we just uh, lost that one out of the corner, but uh, uh, that's um, Amelie uh, Grassi. She's the next mini sailor, and she's one of two female uh, class 40 skippers in the race. And uh, looked like she had a good start, but I think she thought she might be over. She came back and started again, but maybe didn't need to. But it was a yeah, it's it's stressful, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, it's stressful watching it. I can't even imagine what it's like to be on board. What do you what are you thinking in that situation? 
Just don't be over. <laughs> get the get close to the line, but don't be over. Amazing though, we're seeing Pirelli Look here. Look at those waves. Look and the at that. two, yeah, it's starting to build. So what we're seeing now is obviously the tide's pushing them over the line, which means the tide is directly against the wind. So the sea state is still fairly flat, but it's going to get very lumpy. Up by ne Needles, Hurst, there's going to be kind of one meter and a half, two meter seas. But we can see Pirelli, who were over the line, they had a bit of jostling, and Ipsa, the two Italian boats, very, very fast. Over the line, not a great start, but they're straight back to the front of the fleet there and driving uh, driving pretty hard on the island shore. Yeah, now we're seeing pict live pictures from Hearst Castle here. Look at the waves here. Yeah, I mean, this is what they've got waiting for them, which, I mean, yeah. you, you, you go, it's a, it's a bit of an emotional uh, journey when it's like this out the Solent because you have that initial rush of energy getting off the start line. Then you get into kind of mid Solent, and then what's looming on the back of your mind is, right, we're going through the funnel, the bottleneck of Hearst. And that's when you're really compressing all the water that's trying to escape out the Solent down to this funnel and then you've got all the wind that's pumping in against you and that's just basically the winds hitting the waves and it's kicking up these huge waves and you can see those breaking waves ahead of you and it's like right okay we're ready for the next battle and that's the beauty of the Rolex Fastnet races you have these points of contact around the course where you're never really let off the uh, let off the gas you go through Hearst through the needles then you're into Christchurch Bay and you've got the next headlands and you're preparing for Portland and start point and you know there are so many little chances and breakthrough parts of the race where you can either make a tidal gate or get stuck and if you miss a tidal gate you're stuck for you know you can lose six seven eight hours on the uh, on the other Ooh. boats in your fleet so it's a it's a crushing race in some respects but that's why it's the biggest offshore race in the world that's why people come back it's yeah let's, it's addictive let's see that start again i think i think we need to watch this again of just what exactly happened for so many to go over the line like this Let's have a look. Talk us through this. Well, I think we saw on the, the side of Pirelli, power's nothing without control. So they're coming into the line and you can see them, too much power, not enough control. Ipsa trying to get the boat borne away, but not enough ease on the sails and they just can't get that boat back to the start line. Pirelli sitting there, tacking, trying to get the boat back behind the line. I'm not sure whether they did make it, but bang on with the, uh, the three brothers there with the lighthouse, you know. You can teach these old dogs tricks, but the young, the young fella there, 14 years old, hats off to him. What a great start <laughs> and, uh, and leading the fleet out to the, uh, off the line, heading to the needles. Yeah, and you're a dad, Pete. I'm a dad. All the dads at home, if you had your 14-year-old son making a start like that in the world's biggest race, you'd be pretty chuffed, wouldn't you? Uh, you, you would indeed, and you wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't do the night shifts anymore. You'd hand it <laughs> over to your son. It's perfect. Well, you can do the night shift, son, and dad will see you in the morning. Can I just point out, going past us right now, a lot of people around here will be very familiar with this, the Red Funnel Car Ferry. We've, we've all been honoured to get over here. Little fact for you, uh, Red Funnel have actually been ferrying people between cows in Southampton for over 160 years, which is remarkable. They carry, I think, about 3 million people back and forth every year. Uh, I can imagine it's a pretty tough job, isn't it? Particularly on a busy day like this. A lot of traffic coming back and forth here, uh, including... The boats. I mean, it's just a—it's—it's it's quite well, beautiful, Holly, isn't it? In it a way? just goes to show you, this is uh, this is a public area. Yeah. You know, we don't shut it off for racing. You know, commercial traffic. In fact, we have uh, a, a member of British Ports here on the platform, and uh, and he's our advisor for that. Whether we should delay because of big ships coming through, we talk with them. We make sure it's all safe. But we don't own this water. Yeah, it cuts quite a figure moving its way through there. Uh, so we have three starts down now, five still to go coming up. We'll have the, the IRC classes. Now, many of those taking part will be Corinthian, and for some, it's actually their first time taking on this challenge. Um, so we managed to sit down with Rourke Admiral, Bull, Rourke, Rourke Admiral Mike Greville, who's taken part in over 20 fast nets, and we've been asking for his top tips. <laughs> My top three tips for participants in the Rolex Fastener Race would be first, being well prepared, having the boat well prepared, having a crew that, that knows itself, uh, knows themselves well and works well together. The second tip would be to maintain very good shipboard routine, make sure that the watch systems are followed, that people are getting adequate sleep and they're being properly fed. And then the third tip, I think, really is just about weather and working out where you're going to go, your strategy for dealing with whatever is coming your way.
here we go. Now we've got the next fleet starting IRC zero and IRC one. A very, very competitive IRC fleet. These guys have been competing in the Rourke races all this season. And we've got Lisa McDonald here with us on the, uh, on the squadron balcony. Lisa, talk us through the fleet and who are your favorites and who are you going to look out for? Hi, Pete. It's a pleasure to be here today. You know, I've been watching these guys get ready over the last couple of days. These are the big boats in the fleet. These are the big guns. They've come out here ready for some good hard sailing. I can see that everyone out here has been looking at their storm sails this morning. They're now vying their, their startup positions coming to the line. We've got some rock star crews. We've got crews that have just recently maybe joined their boats. The thing that's interesting about this class to me is we've got some really big boats up to 22, 27 meters, I think I saw is the biggest one, all the way down to 11 meters. So it's gonna be all on on the start line and I can't wait to see what happens when they get out of here with this tide and the wind building as they go down the Solent. Yeah, like you say, Lisa, there are some rock star crews out there and one of them I was speaking to yesterday, Steve Hales, who's a navigator on RAN on the 52. And, uh, and it was interesting, you know, with someone with so much experience, they kind of know what's coming and he was quite nervous about the conditions that they're going to see tonight nervous for the boat nervous for the other competitors out there you know it's it's going to be a hard race and for these really experienced ocean races the nerves never really go away do they no they don't in fact i think everyone's got a little apprehension going to the start line no matter if it's a nice day you know with the moderate forecast or a forecast like what we've got against us there are a couple of frontal systems coming through everyone's been doing great checks on their boats last minute preparations and going out today i think as the day goes on and the weather builds the sea state will build the conditions will get tricky so many boats out there to look out for not only what you're doing on your own boat yeah, and I think one of the one of the things like you alluded to there with the uh, Super Zero and Zero, there are so many boats of different shapes and sizes and so many boats at different pace. So when you're coming off the start line, it's hard, very hard to predict. If you're in a one design fleet, you all pull the sails in and accelerate together. So you've, you've got to be very, very aware of those boats around you on the start line. Exactly. I think the, um, you know, the 60s, there are a lot of, I see a lot of Volvo boats also scattered through the fleet and they've done a lot of hard time. They know these conditions. However, we're in a confined area. This isn't ocean racing conditions that we're leaving in. This is a confined area, big conditions, lots of boats. And also as they go down the Solent, and as you've said before, how they'll pick up at different speeds. Equally, the smaller boats, if they have a big boat go past them, they might slow down significantly and have to rework their sails and their position to get off again. So we'll see how we go. Yeah, very interesting. And, and uh, you know, when you speak to the more experienced teams, even those guys who've done the Ocean Miles, they were saying one of the key jobs was waterproofing the boat, making sure, you know, they know, and that's one of the points of being kind of responsible in these races. It's, you know, it's going to be tough. And it's very naive to go into those races and not think, right, how can we still improve the boat further all the time for the tough conditions exactly there, there was a lot of silicon and tape flying around last night and here we <laughs> go we've got the commodore the Rourke commodore's boat on screen now eno noir uh, doing its first fast net 45 foot brand new boat and give us give us some give us some knowledge on this pete inside information come on well let's say uh, it's a boatine it was built with jason carrington down in uh, in limington and uh, it really, I mean, it's a fantastic looking boat and it's got to be said, hats off to James, had the, had the boat sprayed in the same colours of his Aston Martin, which was a lovely touch, I'd <laughs> okay. do the same if I had either. Um, but, you know, the boat straight out the box has podiumed in both of its, uh, the Rourke races in the build up. That, so very, very good boat, a very good team. Those guys have sailed in the, uh, the 40 foot classes for, for many years. So they're, they're very dialed in. It's a great crew, a very good looking boat. And definitely it's going to be looking to, uh, to take some chocolates in this one. Yeah, and as Lise was saying earlier, we've got, you know, the biggest boat in this class is Lucky. That's a 1K88, right down to, I think it's Paul B. Marine or the, the 30 footers, the 10 meters. So it's, that is a massive uh, range, isn't it, uh, Lisa? It's a huge range. I mean, I think that the leaders will pop out quite quickly if they get a good clean start. And for the rest of them, they'll all be vying for clean air and clean sea state. I'm looking to my left down the Western Solent. The sea state is building up a bit, um, but the range of boats is exciting as well. And I think we'll start to see little groups kind of filter out into groups as they head down the Solent. Yeah, and, um, and on the... And there we go. That's the one minute signal. <laughs> and, and as we can see, uh, we can see Teasing Machine on screen now could well be the boat to be it's winning the rock season has had a tremendous results and uh, we're going to go shortly to steve cole to go into countdown is that right holly we got uh in just a few minutes yes i think oh, we're just, just a, few a few seconds away from this but look who who are you looking out for in the, at the very start of this then 
Wow, look at that. You said teasing <laughs> teasing machine is a huge, strong tip for success in, in the ice in the IRC zero. Okay. Oh yeah, but can you guys can you actually pick out? Uh, oh, we we're 20 seconds to go. Over to Steve Cole. NED one still closest. NED one is still closest. NED one coming up. NED one is closest. This is both. Yeah. All clear. Okay, you can tell actually conditions have calmed a little bit out there, which might have something to do with that. But yes, all clear, all through. What did you make of that? A decent start there. Well, uh, if they were behind the line because they were really close, NED1, that's the uh, Volvo 65 Jiao Joe, and that is chartered to Clark Murphy. And he's got three of his family on board as well. This is really a family affair, isn't it? We're hearing so many of these stories. Well, to be fair, Clark Murphy has sailed some pretty <laughs> high-tech boats. So uh, he's got a really good crew around him. He's got uh, Mickey Broughton doing nav. He's got Ian Budgen doing tactics. But, you, you know, th that's the beauty of this particular sport. You can go out in one of the fastest boats in the world with your family and sail with pros. You can't do that in a Formula One car. Uh, Pete, who did you like to look of in that start? Well, you'd have to look at the uh, the Volvo 65s, Team Zhao coming in on Starball, tacking right on the line. You wouldn't want to be any closer than that. They were metres back, flicked straight onto port and now are really in a strong position over the fleet. Wind Whisperer further down the line, they were clear as well, going nicely. You can see the crew stacked on the rail. That boat's going to have the keel swung. They're canting keel boats, so the keels on those are swung to windward for extra right and moment, extra power. You can see those two boats, they, you know, they're going to revel in these conditions. They're sturdy, big, powerful boats. And, you know, these conditions, as soon as you see the breeze in, if you're sailing on those boats, you know you're going to be in for a good ride. I've got to ask, where's Lucky? It's proven quite tricky to, to, to see. I'm also trying to keep my, my eyes peeled I've been for, uh, for a Keller as well. She must be way offshore or right in that pack. Ah, Abby. Abby Childerly has spotted. You see where the helicopter is right now? They're in there, so uh, we can't see them. We're being blocked by the big cells of RAN, and I think yeah. Abby's got it. They're there. It's hard Hold to see. the we, front page. We can see in the shot there, Sweden 520, which is Nicholas Zenstrom, Steve Hales, and the team there, Tim Power. That is an all-star lineup on that boat. Um, very, very good team. Um, they have had a great start. There you know, we go. We can see Lucky now. That's a better there, shot. There we go. I didn't recognise them. There we go, the, lucky uh, the, the USA 2872. Yeah, difficult to spot. Yeah, but, uh, and you can see they've gone for a more of a conservative approach. They just didn't want to get into the kerfuffle on the island shore. And, you know, that boat's a big, a big bruiser. You've just got to give it space to uh, stretch its legs. They will. So, the, sorry, go ahead, Louis. I was just going to get a bit of background on Lucky. What, what, what can you tell us? Right, so she was originally built for George David um, and called Rambler 88. Uh, she's recently passed, uh, passed hands to a new owner, another American owner. And much of the crew stays, has stayed the same. You've got Brad Butterworth, tactician, and uh, you've got uh, um, Andrew Cape, I nearly said Capey then, um, as, um, as the navigator. So, and it's an all-star crew. And yesterday in the press conference, Andrew Cape said there's a 75% chance of actually breaking the race record. We're just looking at Warrior One here at the minute. What, what do you think of that, Lisa? Yeah, I think they're looking really good. I mean, mm. I think getting off this start line, the important thing is to keep your nose clean and keep clean air. You've got so many boats around you. The conditions are actually starting to degrade a little bit in the Western Solent, so you'd be wanting to keep, keep out and clear away from other boats, keep your air clean and get out uh, to be able to maneuver your own boat and make your decisions going out the Solent. And interesting, with, the, with all the 52s, Lisa, you see them there, the main's right at the top of the mast, so they've chosen yeah. not to reef. And sp speaking of a few of the teams, you know, the 52s, they've got water ballast as well. They're very, very powerful boats. And I think there was some nerves. Warrior One have just added 500 kilos of, of water ballast onto the boat. So they've got even more powerful. So they kind of nervously look up at the rig when they load the water in now, just to make sure that the boat's going to stay in one piece when they get into the waves. Well, that's and that, good and over that's some boat, uh, Warrior One, they won the Royal Caribbean 600 2022. On the boat, Stu Bannatyne, Richard Clark, and Will Oxley. That's not a bad combo. 
I'm interested to hear what Mike and Annie have to say from their point of view. Uh, some interesting tactics here, Mike and Annie. the boat end we had team Jayo the Volvo 65 they couldn't have been a meter further forward they just tacked on the gun in fact they were getting into the spectator fleet here and it was very close with the rib but that was a perfect start and and we're f seeing the fruit of their labor right now because they're the most inshore boat and as Mike just pointed out they're really lifting up inside all the other boats so it was a big risk on that start, but right now they're making the game. It's game's looking event. very, very good. And what was noticeable, I mean, this really is the heart of the Rolex Fastnet races. This class of mix of amateurs and pros all on the boats together, many different types of boat, all racing under IRC. And this really is the heart of what the Rolex Fastnet race is all about. I think. Um what you've got to keep in mind when you're racing in a in a you know in a handicap race like this in these boats is each one of them's got you know it's got their forte, hasn't it? Yeah. So as we come out into the breeze, as was said, I think I would quite like to be in a Volvo 65 tonight because it's a brick of a boat. I um, mean, it's designed for this kind of weather. All the reefs go in very easily. Yeah. You know, it's designed for ocean racing, but. Once they get to the fast net rock, and as those conditions start to change and the wind drops, suddenly these IRC designed zero boats, class one boats, boats like Lucky, boats like Ran, they're gonna come into their own. And uh, you know, as they start to go downwind, suddenly those heavy offshore boats are gonna struggle. So I think you know, right now they're thinking, okay, even if this isn't the perfect start, even if we've got to hold her back a bit tonight, you know, those, those IRC boats, they're going to come into their own and they've got to wait for their moment. I think uh, what was interesting about that, what was really interesting about that start is unlike the the, the fleets ahead of them, the old teams, the Amokas and the, and the Class 40, they were all quite conservative, all had similar sail plans. Here in IRC Zero, we had, you know, full mains and, and teams really going for it. So... Uh, and that really is a testimony to the quality of the sailors on, on some of those boats that are making those calls. Whether it's the right call, we'll decide when they get to Hearst, uh, Hearst Castle, if they make it through there unscathed. What's for sure is it's a lot wetter on these boats. We saw all of the teams really hiking the boats down. Yeah. You saw lineups of teams, you know, that's how work that's how hard every single sailor is going to have to work on these boats. It's all about meters on these boats. Back over to you, Holly, in the studio. Again, I mean, it was a perfect start, really, wasn't it, for some, Lisa? But let's have a look. I'd love to get your perspective on this. Oh, it's a great start. I think, um, as we mentioned before, the different sized boats. And to watch some of these big boys come out of the line, the big boats go out, stretch their legs, get clear. We'll be watching them go down the Solent and sort of settle into their system for whatever it may be. This race isn't long enough to go off watch and then back on watch. So everyone's going to be working 100% plus for the next couple of days to actually keep that boat going as fast as it can the right direction and make sure the manoeuvres are clean as they go through their paces. And how crucial is this start? How crucial is it to get the perfect start on a race like this? The perfect start just means that you have more options. You get out in front and you can choose where you want to go. As soon as you don't have a start, you get sort of pushed around by others, your, your options are much limited and that makes it more complicated for your tactics and where you go. Lisa, Lisa McDonald, thank you. Uh, we're going to take a look at, at Hearst Castle now just to, to see... Well, we'll just we'll, we'll stay on the replay just at the minute just to watch this moment here. Uh, I mean, you could look at that for the 65 yes. there, Jowl in the bottom of our screen, tacking bang on the line. If, if you could script how you wanted to start, <laughs> they just played it out. And Wind Whisperer already on port, so they're already up to speed. Obviously, when you manoeuvre the boat, you slow down, so you can see them just dropping back. Wind Whisperer up to full speed, crew on the rail, everyone hiking. Yeah, lovely shots there. That's how you want your boat sail. Crew committed, hiking out. And like Annie says, you know, the 65s, they might not be the fastest boats, but they are absolutely bulletproof. You know, these things are designed to be safe around the world, see the toughing, toughest conditions, go through the southern oceans and come out the other side. So, like, uh, I would agree with Annie, if you were choosing your boat for <laughs> going... Uh, into tonight's front, you'd either want to be on Lucky because it's probably got nice comfy bunks, um, or the 65s because the, they're uh, they're going to be a little bit more heavier and a little comfier. A lot of them looking remarkably calm and confident. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to move over to Hearst Castle now. Uh, of course, that that major landmark of the race, just about 10 miles from here.
Uh, let's see. I think Bank. There we go. Bank Populaire has passed. They, how, how would they be feeling just at this moment? I mean, there has to be a sense of relief here. Oh, they'll just be looking at the open ocean, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> finally, <laughs> we've got some space. And this is where these boats just unleash. You know, they've they've got the the ocean space around them that they can just, uh, as we say, drop the hammer and just let the let the thing perform. You know, they're very. Sailing. They're not quite sailing the angles they want to sail. They're doing lots of maneuvers. Um, and, you know, you can see uh, SVR there, Francis Gabar. Yes, SVR. You can see those hulls punching through the waves. You can see in the, in the bottom of our screen those waves kicking up now. So the tide's very much uh, flooding there, wind against tide there. So the, uh, the boats are going to get knocked around. It looks very smooth on the 100-footer, but trust me, by the time the, the class, uh, class 4... Class three, class two start coming out. It's going to look very bumpy on the smaller boats, but um, and yeah. we're not seeing them fully on the four. There, we've got we got two, we've got two floats in the water, haven't we? Pete? Yeah, I mean they're. They're obviously on the, the this is the approach to Hearst. Mm -hmm. They're going through. This is the tightest area of the course where you know you're you're pinched between mainland and island shore. So you don't have the space, and you're wanting to stay high because you don't want to put the bow down. It means you're going to have to do more manoeuvres. Yeah, we'll come back to Hearst yeah, in a bit, so. but uh, IRC one coming up next, and of course that features a boat. All eyes will be on the reigning champion, Sunrise. Um, they have made some changes to the boat. They've moved from IRC two to one, of course. Um, how will they and the rest of our IRC get on, Louis? Over to you. Yeah, uh, uh, Deja Vu. Spoke to Tom Cheney, the, uh, the, the uh, navigator for, for uh, Sunrise, and he said, it's just like 2021. Well, they'd love to win it just like 2021. And before the race in 2021, they hid in Osborne Bay. They just went and chilled out in Osborne Bay, let it all happen, and then came out. And I wouldn't be surprised, particularly if they're superstitious, that they do exactly the same thing because... We've got a similar start to 2021, and they came out. I mean, you would not have thought that boat was going to win with 10 hours to go. You know, that was amazing what they did at the end of that race. I absolutely pulled the blind and all, all the way through it. And that's the beauty of this race, because it's the overall winner of the Fastlet Challenge Cup is decided by this IRC rating system anybody can win it we had a sweepstake in the uh, media center and we said right you can choose any boat you like who do you think is going to win it all we all chose different boats really and what's interesting and i think people don't realize just how life-changing it is to win a race like this yeah it, it, it is unbelievably life-changing um we've got um a, a, a good myriad of boats here in irc1 as well that's going off and they'll have seen all the big boys seen all the big boys go but we've got everything in here from classic yachts to real high performance um, cruisers. So it, it's, it's, th this will be uh, an amazing sight just for the diversity of the boats. Well, we actually have had a chance to speak to Tom Neen and he told us just how much this has changed his life. Let's hear from him. Once we got out of the Solon, I started to feel pretty ill. And then I had a period where I was you know, in a bad way, to be perfectly honest. I kind of still carry a bit of guilt about that, actually. I still carry guilt that you know, I was in a bad place and the crew pushed on through that first, first night, really. There was a particularly stressful period around Land's End where we decided to go downwind, knowing that the rock was upwind. And I tend to judge my mood by the facial expressions of my navigator. And for that, for a large percentage of that period, he, had some, uh, he was looking concerned. But it all, hurt, it all came good and we made great gains on that leg from the Sillies to the rock. When we went around the Sillies on the way home, we'd broken our halyard lock. So I, the team had pulled, a bo bodged basically a solution to be able to fly our code zero. And we put this sail up and the boat took off like a scolded cat and we were doing t over 20 knots. And someone said to me, oh, we've got this for three hours or four hours or something. And the first th thought is, how am I going to stay awake and drive this boat for four hours like this? <laughs> and then the second thought is, oh, we can make some big gains here. And then it was just a dawning moment, some uh, point in the middle of that night when we realised that we were in this and we all needed to really focus on this opportunity that we had. The consequences of that result have changed our lives. A lot of the team are now you know, being paid to sail for people and that's, that has changed their lives. And that's, that's changed amazing. his life, uh, Mike Neen there. Great to hear from him. OK, IRC1 just about to get underway. Let's get straight to Steve. Boat. 
40 seconds. SWE 1 3. We've got the number of that one out there. 30. So FRA 43769 is second closest. SWA 1 3 now bearing away and running down the line on port. FRA 43769 is OCS now. 43769 OCS. SWA 1 3 running away on port. All clear. Next closest boat 9 2. Well, I've got to say, uh, we had a fantastic start there from Samatom, the Irish boat. Uh, really close to us there, 9244. Uh, Samatom, that boat was purchased last year by the team. Faradaz over the line, just 43769. Oh, another one over the another line. Another one over the line. Yeah. So, uh, well done, Samatom. That's uh, Bob Rendell. Uh, got Connor Fogarty, I believe, on the boat as well, Grand Slow 44. And we've got Abby Childley with me. Give us some numbers, Abby. Who do you like out there? Okay, we'll, have, we'll, we'll, we'll check that one out. What did you think of that start, Pete? Well, by far, no less competitive. The, uh, the boats were all very punchy on the line with, I think, one boat over, but everyone else was absolutely bang on the money on the line on the island shore here. One boat over the line once again. I mean, is that what you'd expect in conditions like this? Um, I think, yeah, with this much tide running, that's a very nice start from the fleet. And again, you know, people are here, here sticking to their the pre-match plans. Over the line, four yeah. three seven six nine. Yeah, a very, uh, you know, again, welcome to the silent, welcome to <laughs> our three, four knots of current under you. Um, but you can see there the crews hiking out. I mean, this it, it's a tough race. These boats, are, uh, the smaller boats. They're just the waves seem bigger, the gusts seem bigger. You've got the crew sitting on the rail. You know, these guys are now committed for the next couple of days of sitting on the rail and, and getting the best, you know, the best they can out of the boat. And I think, you know, that's one of the big key learnings in the RC fleet is you have to sail your boat. You can't get disheartened when the, you know, all shapes and sizes, the bigger, heavier boats are going to take off on the upwinds and you can't get disheartened. You've got to make sure you're sailing your boat to its absolute potential and things will come good for you. You know, it's a long race. You've got to be patient. If you sail your boat to its numbers at 100%, good things will happen. If you get a little bit down and you feel a bit sad that the bigger boats are going quicker, then you're not gonna, your, your mind will be distracted and you won't be sailing to your absolute potential, which means you won't get the result. What I love about this category, I mean, we, it is absolutely packed full of seriously competitive boats, but a, a lot of them here, are. this is just about adventure. Yeah. You know, it's pure adventure. Yep, yeah, I mean, you've got a great mix of uh, pro sailors, pro skippers, you've got skippers who are chartering their boat. Some of these boats, uh, Holly, you know, the crews have only met each other and they've done a, few, you know, a couple of raw qualifiers, they've done their 300 mile qualifiers and, you know, they, they've got jobs, they're going away and, and believe it or not, you look at these scenes, they're doing it for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very well, very well put, and and that, and that's a very good point. That the, to to actually compete in the Rolex Fastnet race, you must have done a certain number of miles. I think it's about five hundred miles in that same season in that boat. You know, ha at least half the crew have. I think. Um, this, uh, yeah. We're just seeing Long Korea here, and you've got a great story about oh, this one. Oh, Jer Jerry Trentaso. I mean, this man is he, this man takes a boat and he waves it like a wand. He's a wizard. Jerry Trentaso took 38 years to win the uh, trophy. Um, he is one of the godfathers of French sailing. Um, and uh, Jerry told me um, a couple of years ago, I am not going to do the race again. Well, there he is <laughs> on the Famous wheel in atrocious conditions. And he made some excuse about why he's out there, but he just can't stay away. I mean, that's the beauty of offshore racing, Louis. You can have the most horrendous race. And you get into Cherbourg, someone hands you a pint, and <laughs> within seconds you're all going, that's the best race I've ever done. Same time yeah. next year, and yeah. you all come back and do it. It's just the addiction of the offshore racing. A beer or whatever your poison is when you get in just cures all the, all the bad stories and only brings out the good stories, and you were way more heroic over a pint than you ever were in the race. <laughs> and you know why it's every two years, don't you, Pete? Yeah, exactly. So you Every forget it. So you, you forget it. You forget it. all the bad parts of it and only remember <laughs> the good times, don't you? That's, that's yeah. what they say. That's just popped up there. That's Bruce Hubert's uh, Zanabu. And that boat actually won the race. Um, certainly, the I better get this right, actually. They won their class in the race um, uh, in 2019. Right. Uh, the JND39. Um, 
Actually, I'm, I'm going to hold. I'm going to hold out now. I'll probably get this wrong and get slaughtered by somebody. But I'm pretty sure that was Lanale Two, which won the 2019 Fastnet Relics Fastnet race overall, and it's now uh, owned by Bruce Hubert. We've got Lanale Three as well in the same class. That's a brand new one. You are the Wikipedia of yachting. <laughs> Louis. It's, it's all whistling over my head, uh, but yeah, I'll take your word for it. You can water. tell me anything and I'll believe you, Louis. Yeah, such yeah. an exciting category this, though, isn't it? Lots of stories to hear. But let's go over to Annie and Mike to get a better view. Annie, Mike, what's happening there? Well, what's really interesting about these starts is that the boats are much, much closer together. <clears throat> There's a lot less of a speed differential between the between the different boats. So as a consequence, the starts in a way are even more competitive and even closer. Yeah, I think actually watching that start, for me, there was a Belgian boat uh, near us, this end of the line, I think Belgium 450. They made a fantastic start. They were very, very close, but not over. Um, but they're on their storm jib, which is an interesting yeah. choice. So we've now already seen them being sailed over by other boats. But I think as Pete said, it's actually just really important in this class to sail your boat. Perhaps their next jib is very big and it wouldn't be a good choice to be on it because they know in an hour's time they're going to be getting hammered. So preservation, I think, is a big thing right now. And I'm watching all those guys hiking out. Yeah. <laughs> and when are you going to go into your watch system? Because every single person you've got on the side of these boats is really counting. They probably don't have water ballast. They need that weight on the side of the boat to help counterbalance the amount of pressure, the amount of wind that there is in their rig. But at some point, you've got to let some guys go down and sleep because it's going to be a long night. And uh, I That's think, right. you know, you've got all that adrenaline, have you, haven't you, right yeah, now? Absolutely. Everyone wants to stay on deck. Everyone wants to put everything into it. If, but if, you've got to keep thinking it's going to be a long race for these smaller boats. They've got five days out here and they've got yeah. to preserve themselves. Uh, and if they, uh, the smallest boat I've done the race on was a Mum 36. And that was gruelling, I can tell you. Uh, you know, you spend a lot of time on the rail. But you're absolutely right, Annie. You have to eat. You have to rest a portion of the crew. And these guys are going to be straight into it. But right now, because of the way they're going to arrive at Hearst Narrows, it's going to be much worse conditions when they get there than we, we saw when the old teams went through. And as someone said, you know, the old teams just looked serene going through there. These guys will be having water right over the boat and it will be really very uncomfortable. It's, it's a kind of bizarre kind of fun, as Pete puts it. <laughs> yeah, I've got to confess, Mike, I haven't done this race in a, in a, in a boat less than 50 foot. And uh, I'm, I'm not very envious of them right now. But we really have to admire the sailors on these boats because, as, as Pete said, a lot of them are amateurs. They are doing this for fun. I just hope they've got good kit on board because I'm already cold and we're just on a motorboat, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's what makes the, 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 um, the, the, the fast knit race just an amazing event is this mix of amateurs, of high-tech boats, low-tech boats, all coming together to race together. It's it's someone described it earlier. I heard it described as like a marathon, where you have the elite runners go off, and uh, uh, and then later on, the, you know, the amateur runners come in their chicken suits. Now we haven't got any chicken suits, but we do have some some small amateur teams that are going to have a, a lot of fun tonight. I think a big key as well, isn't it, Mike? For some of these boats, lots of them have got family members on board, and that's great yeah. because when you're on a small boat like this, you've got to work together as a team. You've got to look out for each other, and um, you know you're really reliant on each other. So, seeing lots of family members on board together is great because they'll they'll know each other and they'll be able to protect each other. And, and what a key. wonderful thing to do together as a family! What an extraordinary achievement to do a fast net race with your family around you. I would love that, but uh, my son's into hockey, unfortunately. <laughs> we'll go back over to you now in the studio to prep us into the next start, Holly. Yes, the IRC 2s will be getting underway shortly, but uh, there may be maybe a number of new entries in the race this year. But as we've just been hearing, we have been talking about so many of the Fastnet veterans too. And um, perhaps one of its most experienced sailors is IRC 0's Richard Matthews. Now he's taking part in his, would you believe, 25th. We actually met him last week and we asked him just what draws him back time after time. 
Um, it, I suppose it's it's the big race. It's the one race that you you want to do just to to prove to yourself that you you've got the ability to do it. To measure yourself against everyone else, it, it's a it's a it's a crusade. It's a it's a pageant. It's like a siren call. It just draws us back. Not not me, but the whole fleet. It gets bigger every every year, and we've seen the the the. the the course, the Irish Sea especially, in all its moods. We've seen races where people have retired because they were running out of food and water. We've seen, obviously, storms, we've seen gales, we've seen flat calms, we've seen it all. And uh, that, it, there's, there's always something that's, that's different in, ev in every fastnet. Um, weather, of course, is the big thing. And in the early days, as you know, the weather forecasting was very hit and miss. I mean, we listened to the shipping forecast on the BBC and that was about it. I remember moments in sailing and your sailing career over the years and the, I can remember many moments in the fast net. Rounding the fast net rock is always a big moment. So experience is, is a big thing. I think not necessarily to win races but to sail safely and to get maximum enjoyment and to do the best out of the boat. I'm much more interested in coming ashore saying we've done our best than I am about a result. The result is a bonus, actually. It's not the reason we go sailing. We go sailing to, to come ashore, having had a great time and saying, we really have done our absolute best here. The rivalry is in people's heads. We, we don't, they're all great sailors. We want everybody to have fun. Some of them will, will already be friends. We hope we can make some new friends with, with sailing. That's the way it's always been. I wish everybody the very best for the, for the race. Richard Matthews there, the voice of experience. I'm sure you can relate to a lot of what he says, but saying that this race is, is like a siren call. Yeah, I mean, it's all offshore racing. Once it's in your blood and you uh, you want to take on the next challenge. And, and it's a lovely story. Like, uh, you know, Mike and Annie said, it's fantastic. A lot of these boats are a father, son, well, near Mother's Largo daughters. on the screen, that's virtually the Royal Court Yacht Club family. I can tell you, there's about <laughs> five different members of the family. They're all for the Royal Cork, and uh, they're all fantastic sailors, sailors all of them. Um, and uh, I can absolutely assure you they will be absolutely pumped up for this race. Yeah, it's fantastic. What a thing to experience as a family. And you know, <laughs> we've actually got two Royal Navy entries in this class. I mean, is there, is there a bit of rivalry there between them, do you think? No, not at all. <laughs> no. I think, yeah. Don't imagine such a thing. Well, yeah, yeah, Holly. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole rivalry between the services, and uh, and the Royal Engineers did the first race in in 1925. 1925 yeah. yeah. So, and they have a big trophy that they all go for, and I know the army have won it a few times. You both avoided the yeah. question. What about the rivalry? <laughs> oh gosh, you don't even want to start there. I tell you, that's proper. Um, but the army, uh, the Fujitsu British soldier, who are in IRC2, um, they're at the moment uh, top dog. But we've got Fast Track 12. Tell us a little bit about uh, this Sunfast 3300, Pete. Yeah, fantastic fleet. This fleet has really come together since, you know, unfortunately due to COVID, a lot of the big teams couldn't get out there because of the social distancing. And the, the double-handed series has really, mm. you know, that's something positive come out of it. Over you know, 100 teams in this race. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a big class here we've got uh, 94 boats in RC2 and, and a, a, a very high percentage as you can see in the screen are double handed and the Sunfast 3300s are cracking little boats they're, they're like dinghies down wind they just blast yeah, along and you've done some short handed sailing Pete what's it like just two of you on, on a boat um, yeah it's good I mean it's all about choosing the person <laughs> You know, you, you've got to be on board with someone and you don't all have to be uh, have the same skill set. You've got to complement each other um, and, and bring your own skills. But, and the two skills have got to be, you know, cover the diverse range yeah. of skills that you need on the boat. And you just mentioned the Sunfast. 38 percent in this class are Sunfast. Sun, it, it's in this class are Sunfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's an astonishing effort. They're, they're, they're a French manufacturer. And, and, and they've got it right, but they're not the only one. I mean, right on screen now, we've got the J99 Axel, which is a French team. Um, you know, uh, th there's a huge diversity. Foggy Dew, that's a JPK 1030. I could just keep going on. 
you know, there's a huge range of, uh, of boats in this class. And I think that, you know, the nice thing, they've got huge numbers on the Sunfast 3300s, but no particular design is dominating. You know, the, mm. there's a diversity of wind, um, wind ranges and sea states when the different designs come through. And, you know, like we say, if you sail your boat well, you're going to get the result. But, uh, you know, then you've got uh, Scarlet Oyster in shot here. It's a 48-foot oyster sailed by the uh, Ross Appleby. Now, that boat's pretty much podiumed. It uh, pretty uh, much podiums in every time it I'll hits the water. You, every race since 2005 that boat's been on the podium on and the class podium and it's really nice Ross Appleby's yeah. father competed it before him he's been racing for 30 years now as we approach 45 seconds to the start yeah let's get let's get over to Steve then as this race gets underway I think there is one class two boat out towards the pin end of the line at the moment the line is clear coming up to 30 seconds FRA 53189 bearing away USA 68900 bearing away onto port Line is clear. One at the far end, can't see the number. USA, uh, correction, FRA 53189. Coming very close now. FRA 53189. OCS. The closest boat now is USA 68900. We have one FRA 5389 OCS. OK, so there we go again. Another one over the line. Fester 2 over the line on this one. Yeah, very unfortunate. Just again on the conveyor belt, exit in the Solent. Just couldn't turn the boat back. Uh, just too close too soon, unfortunately. But a very nice start from the fleet. A little bit more reserved in this fleet. Only a few boats on the line, but can see uh, a few of the Sunfast 3300s coming out the line. And in the middle of it all is Scarlet Oyster once again charging away that boat Showing will their class. yeah they will enjoy a heavy upwind on that boat that is built for the uh, the the big breeze yeah for sure but uh, abby uh, on the binos there reckons the best start was from axel the j99 okay let's find out what annie and yeah. mike think uh, annie mike from your perspective who got off to the best start there yeah i mean i have to agree i think it probably was a boat right out uh, across the line i was tending to watch directly behind us and there were a few boats over, but in general, it, was, it seemed like a more conservative start to me. Yeah, we've actually got um, a, an Irish boat just um, on the most inshore position here. They, you know, they were a little more conservative, probably sort of 10 seconds back from the line. But right now, again, they're in that, that advantageous position where they're the most inshore boat. And we can already see them winding up, can't we, in that lift? Yeah, I mean, the thing about having the tide but underneath you is that you seem to gain height you you the the reality is you stay higher you're able to sail closer to the wind uh, and so it has a massive effect and we we can literally watch it as they as they depart we can watch the boats splitting out and descending apart but this is a a huge fleet and a mixture of double-handed and single and uh, fully crewed boats so it's an extraordinary fleet a very successful use of the IRC rule to keep the the racing very close and you you can't put your finger on which design is the winning design if you sail well the chances are you're gonna you're gonna have a very good race and deliver a very good result over to you Holly Annie Mike thanks okay guys what are we looking at here what's going on well, they, they're, as you can see, like we said, the, the, the smaller boats really emphasize the sea state that's building. You can see a lot of mains ragging. So these boats are very powered up here. The mains flapping need to have a little think about their setup, how to get the main working and the jib working just to keep the boat balanced. But um, yeah, hats off to these guys. I mean, they're in for a, for a tough night, especially the double handed guys. You know, there's no rest. It's not like you can send a lot of your crew down. You've got your guys sitting on the rail. You know, it's all right at the moment. So the guys you see sitting on the rail, that's to give the boats more power. The more power you have on the side, Let's the just see that again, just in case you missed this. Just. Yeah, you look nice. at those gusts. So these Ooh. gusts are clearly coming off the island shore. They're double emphasized. You can see Fujitsu, uh, the uh, the army boat there, 
with the red underside. Now, as the gusts hit, they're tending to be left-hand pressure, so it's lifting the boat so it doubly powers you up. And that's when the mains flap and the helm's got to just push the boat up gently, push the bow into the breeze, feather the boat, we call it, just letting a little bit of air spill off the sails. As soon as the boat starts coming flat, you pull the tiller towards you and get the boat rumbling again. So it's, you know, it's 24-7. It's we, we look at it and you think there's, you know, you don't just bang your autopilot on and go down and make a cup of tea. You are sailing these boats and for the next, I'd say, few hours, especially for these slower fleets, they've got a lot on. Not only have you got to sail your boat, but you've, especially in RC2, you've got to avoid the other 93 boats and it's, uh, as they compress up through Hurst, you know, it, it gets tougher and tougher and the waves build. You know, you, you're going to be thinking as you he exit here, what on earth are we doing? <laughs> you know, and it, it's just remembering that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And, and for the, a lot of the IRC2 competitors, this race will be the longest race of their lives. Yeah, absolutely. And like you say, Holly, it is the longest race of their lives. And one of the key things Annie mentioned is you've got to preserve your guys. You know, as much as you're keen and you want to hike and help the boat go as fast as possible, at some point you have to say, right, guys, you guys go down, get it, you know, try. And, you know, even the things like getting a hot drink, is it too rough to put the kettle on? Are you going to be able to boil water? If you can't boil water, it means you're not going to get a hot drink. You're not going to cook your freeze-dried food. So you're going to get weak. You're going to get hungry. You're going to get a little dehydrated. So there's all these things to consider. Have we provisioned for that? Do we know it's going to be super rough? How are we going to provision the food to keep the guys warm and tired you know, and, and, and energized? And the other thing is preserving yourself, your body. It's food and water. We talk a lot about that. But when you're young and enthusiastic going into these mm. races and you want to go and help with the sail change, have I got the right kit on? Because you've only got a limited amount of dry clothes. You soak your, sails, your clothes with hot water in the first half an hour of this race, you've got a very uncomfortable couple of days ahead of you. So you've got to look after your crew, let the adrenaline die down, clear thinking, never rush into a manoeuvre without having all the proper equipment on, your harness, your life jacket, have you got your dry suit top on so you don't get water down your top and get your clothes wet. Mm. You know, it's just looking after your body because, trust me, offshore, wet, un <laughs> wet underwear is not the place to be. <laughs> we just heard the warning there for IRC 3, 10 minutes to go, just less than 10 minutes now. Okay. But just watching this i mean i don't anyone's boiling the kettle on board right now why would anyone do this <laughs> well you know there are there are points in the middle of the race where i would say to you do you know what you can have my house just get the chopper in and get me off this boat but you know well there'll you, be people on board now regretting their decision you know momentarily you are on the boat and you are regretting your decision but do you know what holly Later in the race, they will have the most amazing moments. It could be middle of the night, the sea's flattened off, you've got your spinnaker up, and there is not a feeling like it. You are in the middle of nowhere, your mobile phone has got no reception, so no one can speak to you, the office can't speak to you, and you're just surrounded by stars, and it's those moments go, God, I'm lucky, this is just like nothing else. And then 24 hours later, you're getting smashed, <laughs> smashed in the face, going upwind <laughs> again, and you want to get off the boat again. But, you know, it's a roller coaster ride of emotion. Well, that's speaking for sure. of a, a roller coaster, let's head back to Hearst Castle here just a few moments ago. Uh, Chiral and Massif, I think we're going to be able to see here. Louie, what do you make of this? Oh, wow, well, that's on the spot. Going from a, a, a JPK to a, a Nimoka, a Fort Nimoka. <laughs> Look at the wave coming off that. I mean, I'll be honest with you, Pete really knows this stuff a lot better than me. But don't forget, Chiral, we reckon, was probably copped a two-hour penalty. We're That's now, right. We're now looking at uh, Massif over to Pete. Yeah, so this was about four minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the 2024 generation Vendee boats. You've got Sam Goodchild with For the Planet. Uh, Sam, I mean, he's he's put the hard yards in and he's been given his first crack at him mockers. He's got a very competitive boat. He's in the, uh, the former For the Planet stable. Yeah, For the Planet, yeah. Um, and, you know... It's, these are <laughs> and he's mixing it with the Maltese there, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Man, no sign of medallia there yet. No, no, no. no Pip will be there. Don't you? Don't <laughs> discount don't Pip. She'll Pip. be absolutely in the mix. Pip with Nick Bub, a great team there. And uh, yeah. there is no more tenacious person than Pip Hare. She gets her teeth into something. She doesn't let go. Yeah, absolutely. And Pip's a great example of just head down, work hard. You know, she absolutely deserves to be with a great boat I, I probably enjoyed her coverage of the last Vendee more than anyone else it, it was really it, it was, was proper amazing, emotion it, it yeah, didn't yeah. hold back in if she was a bit nervous rather yeah. than a Raw, real warts and all exactly yeah. and it was yeah. a great coverage so you know Pip great to be given a crack with a, a you know a, a top of the range racing uh, Imoka there a great effort 
Okay. So we're heading into IRC three next. Yeah, uh, this is one of the two-handed teams. Uh, Ludovic Menez um, did really well in the IRC European Championships, which was held just a couple of weeks ago. Two big races, a 350 miler and a, and a 150 miler. Um, and uh, they were uh, top three, uh, this boat. I can't remember whether they were second or third. They didn't win, but uh, there are some awesome French double-handed teams. We can see two of them on the screen oh. now. And, and can we just mention uh, Imp, who be featuring in this class too, a winner back in 1977. Right. You could write a feature film on this <laughs> boat, you know. Um, so it's an IOR 40. It's from the golden age of the Admiral's Cup. Um, and uh, it's been restored in Ireland. Um, and you'll be able to see it because it's bright green. There, there <laughs> they are. There they are. So this is, a, this is a, a team. They are all from Crosshaven, not just Cork. The whole lot of them are from Crosshaven. Uh, so Ron, Ron Holland design. It's George Radley, um, uh, who's the skipper. And uh, believe you me, they are going to have probably a few tears in the first 24 hours because that will be really hard work. And then a lot of laughter on that boat. And uh, I wouldn't mind betting they can probably smell the muscles when they get to the, <laughs> uh, to the fast net rock on, 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 the, on the imp. What a story. And what a story we've got on right, right now. This is uh, Harry Heist Winsom. And uh, Harry has done uh, what, about 10 or, 10 or so races. Uh, he's done very well. A, a really well campaign boat. He's taken it down to the Rolex Sydney Hobart as well. And uh, an absolute passionate uh, yeah. yacht racer. Let's talk about the double handers. We, we touched on it there. And I imagine, I mean, there's been such a huge rise in the numbers. And I imagine in this one, in this class, they're going to have a big say in the outcome. Yes, absolutely. They're some of the best prepared, best sail boats. Um, and it's a totally different, as Pete was saying earlier on, it's, it's a totally different skill set. To, to sail one of these boats because you're not really double-handed you're really solo you know you get together maybe to have a have a little bit of a meal or to do a sail change or something like that but really you're on deck alone Pete is that fair? Well, why has it become can I just ask why has it become mm. so popular recently well Pete was uh, was mentioning that you know we obviously had the lockdown and um, when we got out you know you couldn't socialize with too many people and that was an actual factor factor life so you could go sailing with your dad but you couldn't go sailing with a bunch of mates. So, like Ellie Driver is doing this race with her father, Jim Driver. So that that had an effect. But uh, it's just a lot easier, to be honest with you. It's much easier to book a table for two than it is for just, ten. Just to point at what we're looking at here. Oh, yeah. There is the trophy. <laughs> Where's the cup with oh. the imp's name there of 1977? Yeah. That green machine. If the if the BBC four minutes to planners, go then to yeah. IRC three. If the BBC planners are watching this, Holly. Tell them to start having a look at a, uh, a feature film on the mighty imp. Oh, keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. There's an <laughs> idea in that. Don't be, don't be giving your ideas away here. Uh, so, yes, just over three and a half minutes then to IRC3. What can we expect here in this category? I mean, oh, it's highly again, yeah. competitive, oh, this one, once again. Yes, and again, a, a big diversity of boats. And, uh, it, you know... Um, we have got a lot, a lot of the Sunfast, which we've, uh, which we've already mentioned. But I think we, we can't forget the conditions. And I must say, the camera work is absolutely superb. Because I know that looks bad, but believe you me, <laughs> it's, worse it's than a it lot worse than that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, difficult start this race. What we're also seeing, and I'm sure Pete's got more info on this than me, is we've now got... The, the current really, really going going out, Pete? Well, we, we're seeing another cell. You can see on the screen it's getting hazy. There's a lot of rain coming through now. Because we know we've got a front coming through, this is going to be a cold front. So, But before a cold front comes through, the wind becomes very unstable. It becomes very gusty. There's a lot of rain, and, uh, and it's very, very shifty. So we're seeing these little cells on the front of this uh, front coming through that we're expecting overnight tonight. So this is a little taster for these guys of what's to come. Very unstable breeze, mm. very shifty in direction, very up and down in wind strength. So it's a, it's a very it's a battle for these guys, and they're going to be wet from now for the next 12 hours or so. Speaking of which, let's go over to Annie and Mike <laughs> and check in. Annie, Mike, how are things looking there? Hi, Holly. Um, yeah, it's wet. It's uh, definitely getting wetter. <laughs> and, um, you know, just thinking that it's amazing looking out there and seeing also how many foreign boats we've got here, especially in this class. Um, 
I was actually sailing last week with um, a Spanish guy from um, Gorilon at J99. They've just come up from Santander with their team. Um, also met last night a German team. They're all under 28. They said they did 79 tacks to get to here from Kiel last week. So not only have they got to go and battle now for the next week, but they've probably already had a week of uh, essentially racing just yeah, to get to the start line, exactly, haven't they, Mike? Yeah. Which makes them very well practiced, which means the starts tend to be quite competitive. But the big thing about the starts here is finding, and we notice it more in that last start, is finding a clean lane because there's so many boats bunched together in the same place. Trying to find a clean lane of air where you're not being disturbed by the boat in front of you is crucially important. It makes a big difference. So two things are playing. One's being very close to this side because you seem to get the, 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 the current more, uh, a current game more. And the other is not to get caught underneath too many boats or behind too many boats. And um, we can also see behind us that there's a lot of different sail choices going on. Those orange sails are storm jibs. So we've said it's going to be very tough for these boats. It's going to be a long race. Um, these sailors have got to you know, really sail their boats. There's no autopilots here. And I think for me, not a bad choice to set up for what's coming in an hour or two's time. It's, it's not about right now. Yeah. It's about protecting your team and being ready for what's coming. So those orange sails are actually storm jibs and we can see them entering the line now. Over, back over to you in the studio to get into the start of this race. Yes, let's get straight over to Steve Cole then. Hey. Coming up to 15 seconds, the line is clear. The line is still clear. One boat on starboard coming halfway down the line, the rest on port. Just coming inside the IDM now. All clear, line clear. There we go, all clear, which is, trust me, is extremely difficult given those conditions. Just how important is it just to find your space at the beginning of this? Yeah, like Mike and Annie were saying, it's very important to find a clean lane. And what a start for the guys just on the inner distance mark here. I think Louis will tell me who that is in yeah, a second. Yeah, very good two-handed team, Les Petits Doudou en Duo. Well, there we go. A clean start, and they're already three or four boat lengths ahead of the fleet. Lisa said earlier, a clean start gives you options. You can go where you want. When you're in the pack, you're sailing. And unfortunately, if you're in a fast boat and you're trapped in with slow boats, you're going to sail at their pace until you can wiggle your nose clean. So, yeah, that's the, uh, the advantage of a clean start. And like we can see, a really mix of sail plans. But, you know you're planning on you're going to head into a lot of bad weather and i think it's all about changing down gears early you don't want to get caught in the squall with all the big gear up you know you want to think right this is going to hit in the next couple of hours while it's still reasonable and we're going to protect our crew and protect our commitment uh, our equipment we'll just change down a gear early get it done get it tucked away everyone can rest then for what's going to about to happen once you're in the storm it's too late you're going to damage sails they're going to flog you're going to break them and then you can't use them again once it's done it's done or you're going to hurt someone so it's all about preserving the crew preserving the equipment and you can see in this fleet some very smart thinking out there you know that it's not going to be one in the next couple of hours it's going to be lost in the next couple of hours yeah and we've got well, like a half a meter not even that sea stay here but once they get out to the needles that could easily be what two meter two meter seas absolutely absolutely and you know the the compression through hearst and through the needles the sea state will really whip up it's a a real compression of wind and a compression of of current so we're going to see big waves there and then as they get out into the bays you know i think the tactic now you're expecting a little bit of a right shift further down the line with the front and as it passes through so you're going to want to play a little more than normal into the next bays protect yourself behind the headlands you'll get less sea state there um and you'll, you'll basically set yourself up to the right of the fleet for those little righties as the wind goes from a westerly direction and starts heading into the, uh, into the north. Yeah, and in general, are we going to look at boats going offshore to stay away from the dangerous land or to go inshore? I, I think, Louie, we've talked a lot about looking after the gear. And the you know I've, I've you know you do a lot of racing in this and you sail with a lot of good navigators and the navigators will be saying no chance let's not take any chances we've got to be in this race we've got to finish this race to win it so you're going to want to say right the logical thing to do is we head for the headlands there's going to be flatter water the sea state in the in the in the bays will be one meter one and a half meter you go out mid channel you're going to be in three and a half meter waves you know you're asking for trouble so. 
and that paired with for this forecast you're expecting those right shifts you want to be it's like if you go offshore you're going to be running in lane eight of a running track if you stay inshore when the right shifts come you're in lane one and and we've got much better weather data now what we're seeing is look last it out last it out tough it out for those 16 hours and things are going to get better yeah yeah look after your boat look after the crew just get through it i mean for, for the for the more um seasoned teams they're going to push, right? They're going to push. They trust the equipment. They've done miles. They're very good seamen so, and, and, and women. So they're going to very, you know, they're going to push the boats pretty much, I'd say, 90% of what they can do. If you're a little unsure, just take it easy. You know, you want to finish the race. What you don't want to do is sailing back down the Solent with your tail between your legs because you made a yeah. silly decision. Yeah, Qu and, and quick shout out in the middle of the picture, Oz, Oz 99. And this boat... Um, well, the team on the boat come all the way from Australia. Disco Trooper, Contender Sailcloth. That's Jules Hall and John Shelton. Couple of laser sailors from Sydney. But they did win the first two-handed uh, uh, class for the Relic Sydney Hobart. Well, Very different conditions, I imagine, <laughs> here than it is <laughs> in Australia. That's a colourful boat. I'll look that one up, shall I? Do, do you know what? It's interesting. You're talking about taking risks, and usually in a race like this, you know, if you want to be successful, that, that, that's the advice is to take a risk. But when the conditions are like this, and when you're dealing, mm -hmm. like we say, with this, these levels of, of, of distance and exertion, you just have to play it safe. Yeah, you have to. And you, it's all about planning ahead and explaining to your crew you know, the, it's a game of chess. You've got to be talking about the next two or three moves ahead. And the thing mm. is, as well, when you're changing down gears because of the, the weather that's coming, it's all about looking after your guys, looking after your girls on the boat, making sure that when the weather starts to pass... But when the adrenaline's and, and pumping, Pete, can mm. you really do it, can you? you? you uh, well, you, you need to learn to because when you, you've got to be ready to change gears back up. It, because it's very easy, once you've been through some bad weather, to convince yourself, oh, it's still quite bad. And you can keep that reef in a little bit too long. You can not make the dip because you've had a there hell of a night and you're too tired to make smart, um, smart calls. So you've got to be ready just to, you know, put the hammer down again and get the boat going before yeah. everyone else get the jump on the next good weather. Yeah. And the thing is, I mean, it's a massive challenge to win the Rolex Fastnet race. And... It does vary, but it's normally IRC one zero. That's sort of you know the big, the big sweet spot for the overall win. But in many ways, the boats in IRC three and IRC four, which are starting in ten minutes, mm -hmm. that's probably a tougher challenge, isn't it? Well, I don't see what the, there is. There will be the boats might go slower. They might not be the technology. But if you tell me the passion isn't there and the drive to win your class. I think you'd be making a mistake. I think these guys are out there. They're passionate. You wouldn't be out there in this weather if you weren't yeah. passionate about the sport, about taking part in this iconic race. And these guys are out there to win. Don't get, you know, the, the boats might go slower, but there is definitely the passion and the competitive edge there. Well, IRC4 underway in less than 10 minutes now. But first, let's, uh, let's recap on IRC3 and watch this again. Just to give us your thoughts on this. A tricky start here, but very impressive, very controlled. Yeah, we, we already put to, picked out Le Putti Dudu on Duo, um, which is the boat that you can see almost uh, the furthest forward. He cut it fine, and uh, he had a bit of time pushing him over. But these guys did really mm. well in the IRC European Championships, so uh, fair play to them. Um, we don't hear the gun go, because uh, we don't really know, but we know it was damn close. But, OK, you know, that was, that was a good start, Pete, but... Um, there's 695 miles to go. <laughs> yeah, and it's going to seem quite quite a long way on these. They're going to feel it now. But um, but like we say, they're competitive. They're going to want to do well, you know. And you can't forget as well the guys who are just you know they're out for the adventure. They want to get around the course. They don't want to come home and say they didn't finish. So uh, you know everyone's out there to achieve the same thing. Get to the finish line. Get to Sherberg. Have a uh, a plate of Mool Fritz and a and a nice cold beer. Makes yeah, it and, all worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, and you all start somewhere. So you know these top boats that are going out there. When they were nippers, they were out on these boats. This is where they learnt their trade. Well, this is when the hard yards are learned. Absolutely. Let's go down the road a little bit back to Hearst Castle then. We've got live pictures. Let's see how we're getting on there. At this iconic place. Okay, there we go. Medallia. Medallia has made this. I think this is live. Yeah. So you had faith. Yeah, they're going the wrong way. Yeah, uh, we're concerned like the Medallia is going yeah, backwards. It, to me, it looks like they're trying to furl up their big J2 and they might be going for a sail change to the J3. And when you do that, you, do, you want to bear the boat away, furl it up so it, it 
fails around its four stay. You can see it happening there. Yeah. Right. And there's only two on board. Oh, and it looks yeah. like Nick Bubb might be up there because they've got a, uh, or, or Pip yeah. even, um, they've got a problem with their furler, so it's not furling away cleanly. Yeah. And sometimes when it's happening really quick, the rope will jump the drum. It's like a rope goes around a continuous drum. So now that's fixed. He'll run back, or Pip will run back, and they'll get that furled away cleanly. And you can see the J3, the smaller cell, furled up inside it. Mm. That's the one they're trying to get out because, as we know, the breeze is building. Yeah. Change down early. And all of these front cells, they furl. But if the furler, if there's a problem with the furler, they've got to gorilla it down. And there's only two of them on board. I mean, they're both very strong, but, you know, Samson and Delilah's going to struggle to get that. Well, th this is the problem, isn't it, Ben? How, how difficult is that when there are just two of you on board? It's just the two of you, or the only yeah. other man or woman on board with you to rely upon. Yeah, it is, it is tough, but that's why you choose your partner very carefully. You know, you've got to have a mutual respect. You've got to have a skill set that complements each other. Um, you know, and, and that's why you see so many successful mixed teams. You know, you, it's, a, it's not all about just brawn. It's a lot of brains involved in this yeah. as well. And, um, you know, it, it's looking after, <laughs> looking after the gear and that poor jib's having a bit of a flogging. Yeah. But, there's, you know, the boat's just out the shed. You know, there's a lot of things that can uh, can go wrong in these amokas. Like Mike said, if you have a failure, uh, you know, it's it's not great on. And they're not really boat. made to go upwind, are they? Uh, you know, they're getting better, <laughs> but no, they're big. You know, when you're inside, it's like someone beating a drum. You know, they're big flat areas. You know, you see these boats and they they look these big flat panels, but when those big flat carbon panels are being pounded by the waves oh it's unbearable and the noise of the foils whistling yeah. you know it's it's it, a feat in itself just to try and sleep yeah yeah but upwind in a, in a mocker would be it would be hard waters uh who have we got there that's Canada um, ocean racing yeah canned ocean racing which we uh, uh, talked about earlier on and uh, that's a nice shot of the boat what could you see about the sail trim there uh pete yeah, nice. I mean, it looks like there are two reefs and a J2 there. So uh, they've just they've gone down a sail size. You can see a lot of these guys, the furled sail, um, well, it might even be a J3, but they've, they've obviously changed down. They're going into the more pressure. Mm. They're all with another reef in now. And, and look um, smooth through the water, don't they? Yeah, they've got straight dagger boards. So mm. the dagger boards go through the deck straight down. Very, very efficient for going upwind. Um, that boat will be... Um, in its elements in, with that wind angle in this breeze going out wind. Okay, back at Kai's then. IRC4 about to get underway shortly. Uh, Pete, Pete, the crowds are still here. Look at that. Still bearing with the weather. Not putting them off. I've got to say the crowds have died off a little bit between yeah. the start of the race. But uh, still, dedication. But looking ahead to the IRC4 then, what are we looking out for? Well, we're looking at Robbie Southwell there. <laughs> a friend of mine, Robbie, he's doing his, I think, first big double-handed oh, race. My word. With um, Joff Carter. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they've done a few races. And, uh, yeah, there was some apprehension there. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, Robbie Southwell, one of the funniest guys in the fleet. I, I hope he's still got yeah. a smile on his face. <laughs> I, I won't tell you the whole story, but two professional sailors walked into a pub. This is a joke. That's, oh, we that's go. how Four that minutes. boat came to be. That's how that boat came to be. But look, the, w the one way to describe IRC4, I think, battle-worn. You know, they have a oh, long road ahead. Ab absolutely. And we've got some beautiful classics in this fleet. And, and uh, as amazing as those Imokas are, these boats will be still be beautiful in 100 years' time and the Imokas won't. Um, there are some, you know, for the people who like classic boats, just have a look at this. There's some amazing, amazing boats. Amakura. Uh, we've got some beautiful swans, for example. So when you've got something like the A19 Maluka there, that's, that's the tiniest boat in this race, how do they fare alongside some of the bigger boys? Well, they are, uh, I'm sorry to say, I, I hope I'm not offending you, they are nut jobs, okay? So this boat is a 32-foot Sydney Harbour boat. That's what it is. That's not the one on screen, but um, hopefully we'll get it on screen. You'll see what I mean. And it's and it's a it's a pro a pro team on that. Uh, who we got on screen right now? That's two one eight three. Two one eight three R. Yeah, so that's Sunstone, very famous, uh, very famous boat. Um, and uh, it's um, I'll just get some details up on it. There we go, Sunstone. There you go. Twelve point one meters. This one. Yes, <laughs> and um, this is a family boat. Um. um the, the, the wind has picked up quite significantly here, hasn't it? She won a class in the, in the Sydney Hobart, would you believe? The Rolex Sydney Hobart. Uh, the six crew in total for this race, including the Taylor Joneses who come from Ipswich. And there's Will and Jenny. And they have their daughter, Izzy, and Will's brother, Tom. 
I'm, I'm glad there's not a camera looking at us directly right now because I can say that we are slightly wet. battle yeah. worn. It's getting wetter <laughs> and wetter. <laughs> We, we are trying our best to stay sheltered. We're still here, we promise you. But yes, it is getting wetter and wetter. I'm not complaining, though, because I'm sure Annie and Mike have a much harder task ahead. Uh, two minutes to go to, go to the IRC yeah, for... Pretty like, sure that's Cassie Mass, one of the smallest <laughs> boats in the race. Can't see the sail oh, yes. number at the moment. And uh, there we've got one of our beautiful classics. I'll just double check before I say. And that is Amakura. So uh, she is one of the oldest boats in this race. I think uh, the second oldest boat in the race. And um, they uh, competed in 2021. And uh, the boat was built to do the fast step, but it never completed the race. And, uh, and in 2021, they completed what the boat was for. And they're back again this year, this time with a full crew. And uh, shout out to the, uh, the Falmouth Posse, because this is a... Uh, a Falmouth it is really tiny, but look, that's that's what makes the IRC force class just so it's wide open. You know, there's such a huge variety of boats. Oh, you have boats under ten meters competing <laughs> against this, and all it, under this uh, IRC rule. And it's it's just such great stories behind them. There's um, one minute, one minute to go for the start of the IRC four class. Pretty sure that's Sun Hill three. And uh, one of the media team reckon that they might win it overall. They were well, this is it. This is the yeah. chat, isn't it? That this, in this category, in this class, we could have our winner. Oh, it's ugly duckling. I beg your pardon. The, 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 the rain's getting to my binoculars. Oh, we went to Steve Cole on the start line. Next closest boat, 8285 GBR and GER6791. Those two boats are now bearing away. The German boat is still... Going inshore, we have FRA 34824 bearing away now. All boats bearing away onto port. Uh, the German boat is turning back, but it is too late for him, unfortunately. 10 seconds, the line is clear, apart from the initial boat we called. So just a GER 2193. Oh, one more over the line, trying to establish which one that was. Um, but yes, yeah, Proven, Proven over the line, a okay. German, a this German a boat. Favorite of mine, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sean, Sean Langman oh, from Australia, wow. Maluka, Sydney Ranger. I've been following these guys in the build up to the race online, and um, um, that Sean selling his son Peter and Gordon Maguire, veteran of four ocean races won the sydney hobart six times yeah yeah they'll be uh, disappointed i mean look that, at that thing rocking and rolling <laughs> they're, yeah. they're braver than me <laughs> i mean it's basically it's a bunch of pro sailors on a pirate ship which is only supposed to go out and stay in the harbor yeah. that's what they do but I this boat has completed lots of rolex sydney hobarts okay so it is there was really strict safety checks and they passed them all yeah. So this is this the second oldest in the in the entire race, is it? Uh, yes, it is. My yes, goodness, but they have passed of... all. But yes, rather them than me. Yeah. Uh, Annie and Mike are back. <laughs> Annie, Mike, how's it looking from your perspective? Oh, have we lost Annie and Mike? Annie, yeah, Mike. We've, we've, yeah, no, we're here. Can you hear us? Okay. Well, we're watching the this start. It's a, a pretty. Uh, well, it's a pretty close affair, like all the other starts, and the uh, Sunstone, I'm, lo I'm looking at Sunstone, which is pretty famous yachts in, in raw terms, uh, actually uh, setting out on God knows how many fast nets she's done, I'm sure Louis will know, but, uh, you know, just an amazing start. It's, it's, these are all the real enthusiasts, the kind of hardcore of what makes up the Rolex Fastnet race, you know, the, this is the, the, the nitty gritty of it all, and I, I got to be honest, I'm not envying these guys uh, um, uh, tonight, it's going to be pretty gnarly Yeah, I'm with you Mike, I'm, I'm not envious watching these boats right now, but I do have massive admiration for these sailors I mean, uh just look at the size of those boats. I'm not even sure I'd want to go out for a, you know, a day race, um, let alone what's probably going to be a week for some of these boats out doing this race. But um, as Holly said, they have been through stringent checks, haven't they? they? We know that these boats are ready and prepared for this kind of race. And um, I bet 
some of those old boats. They might look old, but I bet they have a good oven on board. I think the wonderful thing about a sport is I love to look at boats like SVR and you know, that's cool. But these boats are beautiful as well. And you look at an old classic boat and... And I don't know about you, but I get just as much joy looking at those boats as I do from the high-tech and, and high-performance boats. Yeah, it's, it's not about the speed your boat goes. It's your boat relative to the other boats you're racing. And, you know, these boats are battling against each other to win Class 4 and to get a good position overall. And some of these boats will be, will be the huge carbon boats. That's what's amazing. Thank you very much for uh, everyone for watching us, and um, yeah, we will be thinking of these guys in the next 24 hours. Absolutely, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, back to Holly. Oh, Mike, Annie, take care. Thank you so much for all your contributions, and thank you for everything today. Yes, go get yourselves a towel and get a warm cup of tea there, I think is in order. Uh, what a start, I mean, we, he's, Mike sums it up there. This is the hardcore, isn't it? This is what it's all about. It really is indeed. I, I don't think I'd be brave enough to take on the uh, the far set of this weather in some of those boats. But I absolute, you know, aberration. Hats off to these guys. They're going to have a hell of a ride. And um, night one will be quite scary. <laughs> but you know, like we say, they've done the training miles. They've done the racing miles. There's very strict safety checks on all boats, and, and you know these guys will have will have passed and gone through it and have done their due diligence to make sure they're ready for what's ahead of them. So hats off to them, good luck, and enjoy the race. Yeah, and uh, that's quite a, a a a moving picture actually in the history of this race. That's the Sigma 38 Sam. That design came about from the 79 disaster. So when 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 that happened. Um, in response to that tragedy, um, the Royal Ocean Racing Club, the Royal Thames Yacht Club, uh, uh, collaborated with David Thomas, a designer, and came up with a Sigma 38. And um, that's, um, you know, the lessons were learnt. And these boats going out into this terrible weather, um, they are forewarned, they are forearmed, they have had training, they have got the right equipment on board, or they're not allowed to race. Yeah. And that wasn't like it in 79. And, and I think, Louie, you know, there's a... Uh, you know, you have to learn your lessons from what goes on in the past. And, you know, we there's a lot more technology available to these teams now. You know, they have the weather forecasting. We have very good weather briefings that are available for everyone. You know, the the um, the Rolex Fastnet, they put on a weather briefing with the experts. And, and that is not just there at the briefing. It's online. People can go away and study it, make a plan. And, and you know, is this for you? Do you want to do you want to shelter in a bay? Do you want to just back off? You know, this is coming. It's not like there's going to be any shocks anymore with the weather. It's so detailed and forecast. So, you know, lessons learned. There's a lot of technology out for, there for these guys. The technology for equipment, for the boats, for the sails, for the spa manufacturers, everything has has improved. And um, you know, these boats are heading off. But uh, you know, they're well put together. They're well practiced. You have to do the training miles in the walk races. So you have to qualify the boat. You have to qualify the crew. And uh, you know. They know what they're heading out into. It's well forecast. I'm happy to be sitting here with a cup of tea talking to you, Louie. But, uh, yeah, hats off to them. Yeah, absolutely hats off to them. And, um, the, uh, as I said, the weather's, got, uh, the, the weather's really come in quite a lot. And um, it's wonderful to see them all get away safely. I mean, it's a relief for the Royal Ocean Racing Club that we've got away without any major incidents. Um, they will monitor this fleet. 24 7 and you can follow the fleet as well i'm sure we're going to have some graphics come up pretty soon uh, that shows you how you can follow the fleet um but uh, we'll be following them i hope you will as well and um the um irc4 boats just disappearing into the western solent and um wow what an experience and i'll tell you what louis it's it, what's quite nice to see is there are really not many boats heading back down the Solent. So there are not many boats who have turned around. It's really nice to see the boats heading off into the Western Solent, and we're not seeing many boats heading east, so that's great news. Thanks so much to Pete and Louis. Yes, it is wet and wild out there. We're back in the studio here with uh, Michael Boyd and CEO of the Royal Ocean Racing Club, Jeremy Wilton, has joined us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Holly. What a day. What a day. Uh, Michael, tell me, what did you make of the start then? 
Well, I think the most encouraging thing is that uh, unlike uh, 2021, 20, this was a very safe start. Uh, there were a number of factors in play. The wind was a factor. It was more from the south than from the west. And uh, therefore, the boats weren't uh, tacking and uh, getting very close to each other. Mm. So all of the starts seemed to have gone uh, very well. It was interesting to see how uh, prepared, some might say over-prepared, some of the boats are for the weather that they're going to face fairly soon. So we saw quite a lot of orange sails yes. there, storm jib, tri-sail, and so on. Uh, funny enough, we looked at a couple of boats there. They seemed very upright, very comfortable, and they had, had the same speed as the more rigged boats. So they may lose a little early on, but they may, uh, they may relish the fact that they have uh, such sails uh, already deployed when they come to the sea at, uh, towards uh, the Needles Channel and, and greater wind, which is forecast. And uh, Pete Cumming, you've, you've joined us once again. I mean, was there anyone there, anyone that made a start that you weren't quite expecting? Um, no, you, you look at these, any start, whether it's the, um, the multi-hulls, RC4, you know they're going to be competitive. These are, you know, the passion, the commitment to the teams is no lesser as you move down. The boats are a little bit slower, a little bit smaller, but the starts were, were brilliant to watch, very competitive, all the boats on the line. You know, for, for me, there were no real standouts. The fleets looked great. I mean, obviously, the, the multi has got away and the old teams put the hammer down and, uh, and got up on the foils, but it was lovely to see the fleet get away. And I've just been standing on the, on the balcony with Lue, and what's lovely to see is how well put together the boats are. And, you know, we're not seeing any boats returning back to the Eastern Solent, so it's nice that the boats are heading out and, uh, and the fleet look in great shape. And I mean, tactically, obviously, Michael, we know that the weather is it's, well, it's keeping up with tradition. Let's just say that um, it is challenging out there. What, what will they be thinking about as they move forward? Well, I think I think, frankly, uh, the conditions are not ideal, to say the least. It's I would say it's very miserable on almost all the boats. Mm. Um, they still have quite a lot in front of them in the next period, say the forecast is up to two o'clock, three o'clock tomorrow morning. And they, they just need to conserve the boat. Uh, as has been said before, they need to conserve the crew, they need to uh, be uh, safety-minded, first of all. And there is a forecast then for more wind in the Celtic Sea, so uh, they, they'll have, have a plenty of challenges. It's a, it's a marathon, for some it'll be a four-day-plus four uh, race, and you have to be sharp right up to the very finish. So managing that is uh, not easy, it's, uh, the endurance uh, will be a key factor. Mm. And the fit, fitter and best prepared and best supervised uh, yachts in terms of leadership from the skipper and so on, they're the ones who are going to do well. It's not going to get any easier, is it? Well, no, there will be. Uh, it's a long race and there's, uh, there, there, will, there will be easier weather. There will be sunshine, there will be calms, uh, there will be ideal sailing conditions according to the forecast, nice uh, uh, downwind legs, reaching legs. Uh, but they will seem, as you're thinking about it now, they will seem very far away with a couple, of, a couple of big hurdles to cross before you get to that stage. We can go live now to Hearst Castle once again. Pete, it's getting very busy there. Let's just take a look and see who's made it there so far. Things getting very interesting. And this, of course, this is such an iconic moment for so many of these sailors, isn't it? It is. It's the next big hurdle. You know, you're sailing up the Solent and you can see the breaking waves at Hearst. You can see where the wind and the current is funneling. And with the bigger fleets, the, the IRC Zero, Super Zero, we can see Karu here, the 52, and we can see, I think that's Ran just behind them. Those fleets, there's going to be a lot of traffic to get through. They look quite nicely spaced out here, but uh, believe me, as the numbers start building in, those, uh, in the channel there, it's going to get quite hectic. So, And you can see those breaking waves, the, the currents really flooding out. Look at the bales crushing through there. I think that's Richard My Matthews' oyster catcher there pounding through. It's... Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's getting right spicy, that's for it sure. It is a bit. Michael, you must have some memories of, of, of Hearst Castle. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, my most fun one was, uh, and I, we were talking about how the small boats can compete with the big boats. We were on a 35-footer at exactly this point uh, many, many years ago, and we came across Ragamuffin, uh, sailed by the late and very famous uh, Sid Fisher. And we were delighted to be able to call starboard on him and get him and his entire crew of 12 people uh, to change, uh, change over to the other side. Uh, but that was uh, short-lived. Uh, the rest of the race we still had to do, but we dined out on that, so to speak, for <laughs> a few hours after that had happened. Oh, I bet. And, and look, Jeremy, welcome. I mean, the Ocean Racing Club, as it was known back then, it was founded because of the Fastnet. What does the 50th edition of this race mean to the club and to the members? 
Well, the club, I mean, the, the race is part of the club's DNA, as you just touched on. You know, the club was based and created around the fast net race back in 1925. And because it's such an intrinsic part of our DNA, it's, it's, it's a hugely important race. Yes, we have a great calendar of races and a great, great profile of races and international races now, but the backbone of them and the one that, you know, that the club, as I say, was founded on is the Rolex Fastnet race. And it's part of the club's DNA and it's something which means anything and everything to all our members. And as Michael will know, being an Ocean member as well, is that they've done the miles. You know, to qualify as an Ocean member, you had to have done either a fast net, used to be the original standard, and you couldn't join until you'd uh, done a fast net. Mm -hmm. And now it's 500 miles or two nights at sea, and that's what you have to be to be an ocean member of the Royal Ocean Racing Club. So this race is a, is a fundamental part of it, um, and it, it's huge within our history. And now to get to the 50th is a huge milestone. And to put it into context to people who are watching, 50 doesn't mean 50 years because it's a biannual race. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was annual for the first, I think it was the first few years up until 1935 or 37. Then we had the break for the war. You know, this race has been going 98 years. Um, and this is the 50th edition. So it, yeah, it, it's hugely, hugely important um, to the history of the race. We can see that history, can't we? We, we oh, have the cup right trophy. here and look at yeah. it. And you know, to touch on both what Pete and, and Mike were saying, you know, and you see the names on here and you see the evolution of boats. You know, Michael's talk about the safety side as, as Pete has. Mm. And again, you know, the, the Rourke's been you know, so involved after the tragedy of 1979 on the development of, of, of safety at ocean racing yeah. and how to develop it and make it a far safer sport. And we're very proud that, you know, we've been, you know, played a huge part of that. And hopefully you've seen that, you know, Michael touched on it about how prepared he thought the boats were yeah. from the start line. Um, and I think that's been reinforced. It's about the briefing. It's about people being, you know, being diligent and taking responsibility for what they're going to expect. And they are, as Pete will know, the next 12 hours isn't <laughs> going to be the most fun part of their lives that they've, uh, that they've endured. They're going to endure, endure a lot more breeze, a lot more, uh, a lot more you know, bigger waves, potentially yeah. three and a half metres, I think they were, the meteorologists were talking about, which in some of the smaller boats is pretty big seas. And look, Jeremy, it's not too soon to talk about the next edition, 2025. And not only will it be the centenary of the race, of course, but for those who don't know, there's actually going to be a very special revival too. Correct. Um, uh, the club also has a very famous part that, uh, of a competition that it created in 1957, which is the Admiral's Cup. And it was the unofficial World Cup of offshore racing, team based around internationals um, and, and, and as you can see it on the screen now, there it is, the Admiral's mm. Cup this magnificent trophy um, and we had a gap of 20 years and uh, we're bringing it back in, in 2025 still team based, based on the old principles of what the old Admiral's Cup was which was about three days of inshore and then a combination of offshore racing we have a race of not less than 200 miles and then finishing with the Classic which is the Rolex Fastnet race. And already we've had 11 countries uh, express their interest in taking part again. And we only announced it maybe, what, about three or four weeks ago that we were bringing it back in 2025 as part of the club's centenary, which again, to reiterate a point, and this beautiful trophy here that people mm. could be racing for is that, you know, that 100th year celebration of that first race back in 1925. Well, there's still plenty to go here in 2023, of course, uh, for the 50th edition. But to Jeremy, Pete and Michael, thank you so much for your time here today. Thanks for being with us. And uh, to you at home as well. You've been getting in touch in your droves. I know that you've been enjoying this. Uh, let's have a little look here. Pip Pair will win, apparently. Pip Pip Parade, somebody <laughs> says. Uh, Paul Eccleston Brown, uh, a call out to the Toll Ships Youth Trust Challengers in IRC1. Yes, we didn't get a chance to mention them today, especially to the crew of Challenger 2 who have fundraised to pay for the youth crew of Challenger 4, which just says it all. It is absolutely remarkable. Uh, Nika Camille Konuku, good luck. Mojo Rizinkan on board is my son, my son. As we've been saying all along this, it's really been about a family affair. So thank you so much for everyone who's been getting in touch today. We hope that you've been enjoying this because we certainly have, despite what we may look like in all the wind and rain. We've, we've enjoyed it, haven't we? Of course. It's been brilliant. Great well, fun. Thank you. To be fair, this edition of the Rolex Fastnet race is just getting started. 
this is just the beginning uh, for the 3,000 or so sailors who are currently making their way to the Fastnet Rock. So there's plenty more work to be done and you can follow the whole race online using this tracker. Get online, take a look. Lots of updates from the boats themselves on our live blog at rolexfastnetrace.com. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok and on Twitter. And if you've missed any of the action this afternoon, you can watch the race from the very beginning. Well, 98 years ago, can you believe? Seven, seven boats lined up here on the Isle of Wight. Nearly one week later, it was Jolly Breeze who was crowned the Ocean Race's first ever victor. Uh, whose name will be engraved alongside hers and so many others on the Fishnet Fastnet Challenge Cup. Mm. Uh, we can only wait to find out. Uh, thank you so much, though, for joining us here in Cowes. It has been a blast, it's fair to say. Thank you so much for watching at home. Thank you to our incredible team here, from me and the whole Rock team. Thank you very much, and good luck, of course, to all our competitors. But it is. Bye for now. Good luck. Thank you, Holly.